And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion in her name. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I have great pleasure in opening today's debate on Scotland's transition to a carbon neutral economy, uh, the first uh, for this Parliament. I anticipate that Parliament will return to this issue of just transition in one form or another many times, but I hope today we can reach a consensus about the type of transition that we do want to see. We all know that the central aim of the Paris Agreement is to keep global temperature rise to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5. Today's debate, however, focuses on the part of the Paris Agreement that says we must also take into account the imperatives of a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs. This is central to the government's economic strategy. In a happy coincidence, it was when I was Fair Work Secretary that in 2015 we established the Fair Work Convention to identify and promote existing good practice. We have endorsed the Convention's vision that by 2025, people in Scotland will have a world-leading working life where fair work drives success, well-being and prosperity for individuals, businesses, organisations and for society. Taking into account the imperatives of decent work and quality jobs as we increase our efforts to tackle climate change is a natural step. The First Minister had no hesitation in supporting the Solidarity and Just Transition Silesia Declaration adopted at the climate talks in Poland last month. The declar uh, declaration stresses the need for a shift in thinking to recognise that decarbonisation and economic growth can and must go hand in hand. It notes... Uh, yes, of course. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary aware that uh, largely as a result of President Obama's efforts, there are 800,000 people in the United States in the uh, renewables industry and only 50,000 in coal? Here, where we have a more favourable environment, will we also ensure that there are excellent jobs for those in the oil industry, which is many years to go, uh, who will be able to migrate to new renewable and other energy uh, source industries. Camera Secretary. I'm not sure I was aware of the specific numbers of the uh, employment uh, sectors in uh, America, but I was aware uh, of the general sense in which uh, uh, coal played a less great part than renewables and that was perhaps a uh, something that the President was not uh, entirely aware. Um, uh, I think it is important and, and, and we do need to remember that the, the kind of transition that we're talking about can be disruptive if it's not handled uh, carefully uh, and well. Um, so I, I think it's very important that we see these things going hand in hand. It notes the importance of social dialogue for promoting high employment rates and well-being and plans to reduce emissions. It highlights the importance of sharing experience internationally. Uh, and I'm going to touch on all of these points during my uh, speech. Emissions of greenhouse gases from Scotland have almost halved since 1990, during which time we have seen Scotland's GDP increase by 55%. Unemployment has also fallen to 3.7%, its lowest rate on record. Between 2007 and 2016, Scotland's productivity growth has been higher than any other country or region of the UK including London. Evidently then, we do not have to choose between tackling climate change and growing the economy. We can, should and must do both. We need a carbon neutral future where domestic industry continues not just to exist but to thrive and it will take global effort if we are to avoid industry just bailing out to low regulation countries. That's why our economic action plan focuses on ways to enhance support to businesses, places and people across Scotland. The aims are explicit, to put Scotland at the forefront in the transition to a carbon neutral circular economy. For example, the £12 million transition training fund targeted at the oil and gas sector and its supply chain is helping people made redundant or currently at risk of redundancy to retrain or upskill. In transport, we're working with the Energy Skills Partnership and others to make sure that support is available to develop the skills required to maintain and service ultra-low emission vehicles. We're also working with energy intensive industries, building on existing programmes of support to incentivise decarbonisation as an economic investment opportunity rather than a threat. 
There are economic opportunities from being at the forefront of the global shift to carbon neutrality, but there are also risks and challenges we cannot just wish away. Previous economic shifts, like those we saw in the 1980s, have left scars on our communities. History must not be allowed to repeat itself, and decarbonisation should not happen at the expense of our workforce and our communities. There is a real opportunity for us now to think about how we want our transition to carbon neutrality to be effected. It is an opportunity to consider whether the changes that are needed to reduce emissions might also present opportunities to tackle inequalities and increase regional cohesion. Whatever climate targets Parliament decides upon as we debate the climate change bill, we know that there are going to be some difficult but necessary decisions ahead as we do our bit to limit global temperature rise. Those decisions are going to impact all sectors of the economy and all of our constituents. And that is why it is vital that we start a conversation now and make sure all voices are heard. To begin this work, I have, as you know, established a Just Transition Commission. Over an initial period of two years, it will explore how to apply the principles of Just Transition to Scotland how we can plan, invest and implement a transition to environmentally and socially sustainable jobs, building on Scotland's strengths and potential. How we can create opportunities to develop resource efficient and sustainable economic approaches which help address inequality and poverty. And how we can deliver low carbon investment and infrastructure and create decent, fair and high value work in a way which does not negatively affect the current workforce and overall economy. Uh, and that will show how overarching this is. Uh, members will have realised uh, now that the Finance Secretary uh, is uh, going to be in this debate closing, but it could equally have been uh, my colleague Aileen Campbell uh, as the Community Secretary, because each of these three portfolios have a very uh, strongly invested interest in ensuring this just, uh, just transition uh, works as effectively as possible. So they are uh, cross-cutting issues. Um, and that means that the Just Transition Commission will report uh, to three separate cabinet secretaries, albeit it primarily sits in my portfolio for uh, management reasons as much as anything else. And this approach is similar to other states and countries who, like us, are at the vanguard of considering these issues. Last year, New York State established an environmental justice and just transition working group, and the Canadian government set up a task force on a just transition for Canadian coal workers and communities. Both groups are non-statutory and tasked with providing advice to ministers, and our commission is similar. It's being chaired by Professor Jim Ski, an internationally renowned climate scientist and co-chair of the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Mitigation Working Group. Until the end of last year, he was also the Scottish champion of the uh, Committee on Climate Change, and Professor Ski will be joined by 11 others representing a broad range of interests and sectors. Two environmental groups are represented, WWF and the 2050 Group, which is a youth-run charity empowering young people to tackle climate change. Trade unions are also represented by both Prospect and the Scottish Trade Union Congress. Then there are two renowned academics, four business people from the chemical oil and gas renewables and farming industries, and an expert on fuel poverty from the third sector. Now, while broad membership of the Commission is necessary and should result in some helpful, if occasionally heated, debate, it is not in itself sufficient. The Commission needs to reach out and hear the opinions and concerns of people across the country. It is for this reason that I have tasked the Commission with engaging meaningfully with workers, communities, NGOs, business and industry leaders and others across Scotland. And in addition to having a representative of a youth group on the Commission, I've specifically asked it to seek and consider the views of young people. I want the Commission to hear and be open to all points of view. The Commission will provide a set of recommendations for maximising the social and economic opportunities of moving to a carbon neutral economy, for building on Scotland's strengths and assets, and for understanding and mitigating the risks that could arise. I know there are calls for the Just Transition Commission to be established as a statutory body and for more than two years. In establishing the Commission in the way we have, it's able to begin its work later this month and will provide its recommendations in early 2021. 
Of course, the work that is needed to deliver a fair transition to carbon neutrality cannot be done in two years. The Commission is a first step. And while I believe the principles of just transition are the right ones for the coming decades, whether or not a Commission is needed over the same time scale is not currently clear. There may be alternative ways by which the principles can be embedded across the public and private sectors. To some extent, we are already doing this. The pace at which Energy Efficient Scotland is delivered, for example, is being carefully considered because of the fine balance between tackling fuel poverty and reducing emissions from domestic heating systems. We can do both simultaneously, and we must, but that requires very careful planning while low carbon heat technology is still the more expensive option. We must avoid tackling climate change at the cost of increasing fuel poverty and vice versa. The transition to a carbon neutral economy is a huge opportunity for jobs and skills. Energy Efficient Scotland alone is forecast to support 4,000 jobs across the country once fully operational and over 12 billion pounds is estimated to be spent over 20 years from public and private sources. As much as possible, we want the supply chains and skills needed to come from within Scotland, including from rural and remote areas. That means delivering the programme at an ambitious and realistic pace, allowing for training and upskilling of local people to undertake the work in people's homes. Our progress with Energy Efficient Scotland, the Just Transition Commission and programmes such as the Transition Training Fund will all, I hope, be useful exemplars for other countries as they consider what a just transition should look like for them. Scotland is recognised internationally as a world leader in tackling climate change, and our approach to just transition is also attracting attention. For example, last month, the UK Energy Research Centre specifically recommended that the UK government should consider setting up a process similar to Scotland's Just Transition Commission. Also last month at the COP in Poland, both the First Minister and myself heard directly about approaches being taken in other countries, including Spain and New Zealand, and at an event convened by the International Trade Union Confederation, I spoke of my desire for the Commission to engage widely and provide practical advice on embedding just transition principles. And if I could just say uh, in parallel to that, that um, just transition is a key ask of the International Trade Union Confederation. So I was a little surprised to see the GMV response uh, to this debate posted on its website today. Uh, and I hope that that arises out more of a misunderstanding than anything else. And I, I, I'm willing uh, and able, as I expect other members are, to talk directly to the GMB should they so require it. It was clear at the COP in Katowice that our work here in Scotland has been noticed. We must continue in this fashion, both learning from others and sharing our learning with others. Our approach needs to be positive and optimistic about the opportunities that stem from decarbonisation, while honest and upfront about the challenges and risks. We need to build on our strengths and potential, decarbonising as we grow an ever more inclusive economy. And we must transition to carbon neutrality in a way that is fair for all. And it is that approach uh, which is guiding my approach to the amendments, and we will be accepting both the Conservative and uh, Labour amendments. Uh, however, I do have some concerns about the Green Amendment uh, as it's currently drafted, and we will not be accepting that. Uh, I move the motion in my name, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call on Morris Golden to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. I refer members to my declaration of interest, and I welcome today's debate and the government motion. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary's remarks that we can tackle climate change and grow the economy. In terms of climate change, the recent IPCC report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius delivers a sobering assessment of what lies in store for humanity if we fail to combat climate change. Tens of millions around the world facing drought, billions subjected to extreme temperatures, and a biodiversity dealt a devastating blow. Scotland would not be spared. Communities would face increased flood risks. Our coastal towns, villages and homes are threatened with oblivion. And that is before you consider the impact on our wildlife, flora and fauna. 
Scotland is making progress though, and our overall emissions are down almost 50% on 1990 levels, something that we can all welcome. However, this progress has been lopsided. While we have seen our energy and waste sectors decarbonised, other areas such as transport have seen little or no change. More needs to be done if we are to meet future targets, but we must ensure that we are taking action that creates opportunities for individuals and businesses rather than creating burdens and barriers for them. The low carbon future we all want should be a future that we can all benefit from. Unfortunately, that has not always been the case to date. For example, we should be proud of the remarkable growth in renewables. It has allowed many communities across Scotland to access new funding streams to improve infrastructure and services. However, Scotland missed out on a massive opportunity with 20,000 jobs that could have been created not materialising here in Scotland. Missing out on these low carbon jobs is a lesson we should learn from as we look to both establish a deposit return scheme and decommissioning more North Sea oil and gas facilities. Arguably, the oil and gas sector is most emblematic of the need to ensure a fair transition to a low carbon economy. As the Just Transition Partnership have pointed out, there has been little planning to ensure the protection of the people most affected, in particular, those who work in sectors reliant on fossil fuels. That will not be achieved by tinkering around the edges of our current system. We need a new model that is fairer, more sustainable, and intrinsically better for our environment. Yes, Gillian, Gillian Martin. Martin. Does, does the member um, uh, agree with me that perhaps the oil and gas companies could do a little bit more to um, invest in renewable energies and actually fund research and development to preserve their future as well? Maurice Golden. I agree that uh, oil and gas companies could do uh, a lot more, even in terms of helping us to, to decommission and get the uh, most value from that decommissioning. So, for example, infrared coding of oil and gas platforms that would signify what alloys are contained uh, in the oil and gas platforms would allow us to uh, better decommissioning uh, those facilities. So there's lots more in terms of design of the actual facilities that could be done to improve. I think we see it in the aerospace uh, industry uh, quite regularly, but in oil and gas sector, there's been an overall reluctance to embrace uh, the resale of assets and even the keeping of paperwork so that turbines and generators can then be sold on to other markets. So there's, there's lots more that the oil and gas uh, companies and sectors can do. Um, the overall solution that answers uh, the member's point as well as answers uh, the question posed in, in my remarks is that we need a circular economy uh, strategy. That is the option best placed to capture as much value as possible from the estimated 50 billion that could be spent on North Sea oil and gas decommissioning by 2040. That represents an opportunity to create jobs in the northeast and supply chain jobs throughout Scotland. We must look to reuse assets such as pipelines, either within the industry itself or in other sectors such as construction, where it is worth more than five times the scrap value. Across all sectors, and according to Scottish Government reports, an ambitious circular economy programme could add over 40,000 jobs to our economy. That is on top of the estimated 56,000 that already exist. These jobs would have the potential to reduce unemployment in areas most needed, as well as have a high degree of durability, so they are likely to survive the hollowing out of the labour market. The size of the prize is massive. That means we must be ambitious we rightly set the bar high when it comes to the environmental side of our low carbon transition. And the same standard should also apply to the economic as aspect. That will require us to reassess how government leads on low carbon policy. A good start would be to embed circular economy practice across all portfolio areas to make it a marker against which to judge future policy decisions. 
Beyond that, we must also see a deepening of the relationship between education, business and the third sector. The Scottish Conservatives have already proposed creating new institutions such as a design academy and an institute of reuse to help coordinate these activities. Such a unified approach would allow us to better identify where to focus our efforts, enabling a low carbon economy that is driven by problem led challenges relevant to Scotland. For example, constraint payments are at a record high, but why pay energy providers to turn off production when we could use excess power to, uh, to uh, facilitate an electric arc furnace that recycles steel while giving Scots jobs? It is an indicative example of the type of joined up thinking that produces better environmental outcomes, further reduces waste and generates additional economic activity. Rural Scotland also stands to benefit greatly from this approach as the Scottish Conservatives recently announced a package of measures to support food producers. We believe we can offer these businesses the ability to recycle more and extract higher value from the waste they produce, all while driving the costs down and offering rural communities a wider stake in our low carbon economy. This would involve setting up a microplastic recycling facility and waste hubs, solving the problems of what farmers do with plastic waste now there is a ban on incinerating it and helping the environment as well as creating jobs. We also propose helping farmers and other food producers to set up on-site anaerobic digestion, uh, which would include capital and technical support and would allow energy and heat production that directly helps them lower their bills. Across Scotland, this is the potential to generate an extra £27 million in value from energy generation. There is also the potential to work cross-sector with excess heat, heat used to dry food waste uh, to make it easier to transport for biorefining, an industry that could be worth £900 million by 2025. If we want to see a truly just transformation, Surely this is the way to go about it. Focusing our efforts on the needs of Scottish families and businesses and encouraging innovation and economic activity that uses Scottish insight, Scottish workers and Scottish resources to provide everyone with an opportunity to grow and prosper. Of course, transforming our economy is not without risk and we must be alert to the obstacles we face as we ask individuals and businesses to invest in Scotland. The most obvious is our size. On many fronts, Scotland simply cannot outspend larger competitors or field initiatives on the same scale. One solution is to specialise in a handful of strategies being taken forward that best suit our needs while benefiting from large-scale projects operated at a UK level. Looking at the other amendments, um, we are interested to hear from the Labour Party, but overall we are comfortable with the current situation and don't feel that it's a requirement to have a statutory uh, uh, commission uh, with respect to that. Uh, as for the Greens, uh, I mean, the end of our oil and gas sector is not just by any manner or means, and for us to, to look at that uh, proposition is not something we would be comfortable with at all. Because we believe that innovation is what drives economies forward and hand in hand with transitioning to a low carbon economy, we should be building a culture that rewards those willing to experiment and push the envelope of success. And success is what we need to ensure the transition to a low carbon economy for every family, every community and every business is a positive one. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. And I'll call on Claudia Beamish to speak to move Amendment 15380.3. Ms. Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I move that amendment in my name, just in case I forget later on. Um, this debate on just transition principles <laughs> is very significant for the fair future of Scotland's economy and society in the global context. We will be supporting the Scottish Government motion which recognises how essential a just transition is as we shift to carbon neutrality and net zero emissions. 
Just transition principles are fundamental to the international labour movement, and I am pleased to be speaking here today on behalf of Scottish Labour. Last year's publication of the special report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us that half a degree of warming would put hundreds of millions of people at risk of climate-related poverty. Governments the world over need to really hear and heed this message and plan now for climate justice. This means safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable and sharing the burdens and benefits of climate change mitigation equitably. This means Scotland delivering its fair share on a global scale and applying these principles to protecting people here in Scotland as well, including our future generations. This is the Scottish Labour way, and I want to expand on this, as will other speakers. The 2018 UN climate change negotiations, COP24, held in Poland, had a strong focus on just transition, as we have heard from the Cabinet Secretary. It is really fantastic to hear and see the mainstreaming of the term and to see the 54 world leader signatories to the Silesia uh, Declaration, including the UK and our First Minister. It is this human rights-based thinking that will lead to Scottish that led to Scottish Labour's target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 at the latest, and an interim target of 77% re um, reductions by 2030 to drive action with urgency. But a statutory and long-term just transition commission is a vital companion to that ambition. In this context, it is with relief that I hear today that the Scottish Government will be supporting our amendment, and I'm eager to discuss with the relevant cabinet secretaries how this might be considered. Why do I feel so strongly about Scottish Labour's position on the Commission? Across the planet, now and in the past, there are too many tragic examples of communities and local people being deeply affected by and left behind by fundamental change, both good and bad changes. Too many have lost out and been excluded. As an ex-community councillor in the Douglas Valley, I have witnessed the effects of the failure of government to robustly intervene and support communities in the, after the rapid closure of our deep mines. The effects on communities were callous, long-lasting and unacceptable. We have a collective responsibility to plan strategically. The updated uh, membership of the Commission is welcome, as Scottish Labour is absolutely clear that a Commission without trade unions and those with current industrial experience would be a sham. And I recognise the Scottish Government does not want to create an inexhaustible list of members, but I note a lack of direct representation, although I wonder from today whether the um, Cabinet Secretary has highlighted perhaps that there is transport representation, but also I would highlight the education planning sectors. And do the Cabinet Secretaries feel confident that the membership reflects all key areas of concern? The Just Transition Commission, in our view, must be statutory and long-term. This will ensure that whatever government we have in Scotland, until we reach net zero, fairness and climate justice here at home too, will be at the core of our decision making. Of course, there is a Scottish Government precedent for this in the Scottish Land Commission, with land reform being an equally long-term shift. And, and uh, to aid um, the formulation of its recommendations, finally, we are also keen that it is properly funded with a well-resourced secretariat. And, I, I think it's really important that it is independent of government and is accountable to our parliament, which will aid confidence and respect of all for its deliberations. The Very briefly, I think this is an important part of the debate. Stuart so Stevenson, there is time for interventions, Ms. Beamish. Mr. Stevenson. Um, given that the member is advocating a parliamentary line of responsibility, does the member expect the appropriate member of the corporate body to be the person who comes to stand at the front there to answer questions from members about the operation of, the, of this uh, body, rather than as if it were a government body, we'd hold a minister to account. Claudia Beamish. I understand the point that the, the um, member is making, and there is a debate to be had about this. Uh, I do think that it is important that it is independent of government, and I, I think there is precedent for that to happen. And, uh, and it, it will go beyond each government. And I think the whole parliament should take a responsibility for it. As to who will stand at the dispatch box, I can't answer that at the moment. Um, and I want to reflect as well beyond um, the commission itself on further issues. The Just Transition Partnership is a fundamental 
part of the way forward and I pay respect to the grouping and its collective positive work today. This is a significant partnership, not least because it has enabled unions and NGOs to work together and to develop supportive strategies and engagement with politicians and others as Just Transition has evolved. And Labour does identify uh, with their briefing strongly today. And as far as um, the Green Amendment goes, um, we will not be supporting the amendment today, uh, though we agree with Mark Ruskell on promoting renewable energy and building the principles of a just transition into government policy. We look to the Just Transition Commission to engage with all existing industries, including energy industries, on what part they will play in the Just Transition uh, Commission. And all sectors are increasingly playing their part in the process. Of course, there are the heavy emitters which will need the most support as we progress. The farming industry needs attention here, and if food and farming is to do the job that we want it to do, we should look up to the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, and the government's pace of change does have to pick up. Transport and our buildings, domestic and commercial, of course, are also ones that must be considered by the Commission. And my colleague, Lewis MacDonald, will talk further about the energy sector. Skills are the best insurance for Scotland's future, in our view, and providing support for education, skills and training is vital to maximise the opportunity to change the labour market. And this is a central tenet of Scottish Labour's industrial strategy. This forward-looking planning with industry will avoid all too persistent skill shortages at many levels. There is clearly an obligation for businesses to engage positively with the process and the need for guidance and support from government for, and from the energy agencies. It is our view that there should be some form of obligation on businesses which have been heavy emitters to actively contribute to the transition and this should be discussed further. And there is certainly a need to support businesses of all scales which are developing new technology such as Sunamp which manufactures heat storage systems or Macriba which is creating road surfaces from plastic, uh, uh, plastic input, both in my region. And we will be supporting the Conservative Amendment on the circular economy. With the appropriate financing, the shift to the net zero economy could be transformative. Scottish Labour's industrial strategy sets a focus on, I quote, the developing the economy of Scotland by increasing its diversity with a focus on creating sustainable, high quality employment, ensuring that new jobs are environmentally friendly and broadening our export base. And UK Labour's industrial strategy follows suit with the National Transformation Fund committing 250 billion over 10 years to be shared across all parts of the UK. Setting the right investment criteria for the National, Scottish National Investment Bank is also an opportunity to power innovation and accelerate the just transformation. And a shift to reinvesting pension funds in local initiatives and sustainable industries is an opportunity to protect the funds people rely on after retirement while moving justly towards a fair, renewable future. We must never forget there are also multiple benefits to getting the necessary shift done right. To highlight but three, cleaner lungs and better hearts with less air pollution as we move to EVs and active travel. Better mental and physical health as we move to more safe walking and cycling opportunities. And improved physical health through tackling fuel poverty and creating warmer homes, a UN right. But none of this can happen in a fair way without a really robust just transition process, which Labour is fully committed to working with all who will work with us and of course with the Scottish Government and others, and who have a similar vision for Scotland and how we will achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Mark Rustle to speak to and move Amendment 15380.1. Mr Rustle, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, how we respond to the climate emergency while guaranteeing the economic security and well-being of everyone in our society is surely the most pressing issue of our age. We can't afford to condemn whole communities to the kind of crippling intergenerational poverty delivered through the collapse of the coal mining industry in the 80s, a tragedy which we're still living with today in terms of the legacy on those communities. We have to put in place a just transition that leaves no one behind and take the kind of strong human rights-based approach that Claudia Beamish spoke about. And that's why the Scottish Greens do support the Scottish Government's Just Transition Commission that will be working to ensure that the principles set out by the International Labour Organization are embedded in Scotland. 
And that includes building a strong social consensus on both the goals and the pathways of a just transition. Getting the dialogue going within and between all levels of policy making and action on the ground. Most importantly is the principle that the transition creates decent jobs and provides protections for job losses and training and new skills. Now the work the Just, the Just Transition Commission will undertake is important and it's long term as well. It's inconceivable to imagine that it'll just be here for two years. And that's why we will be lending our support to Labour Amendment, which seeks to place the Commission on a more solid statutory footing. Now the Green Amendment deals with the principles of the Just Transition, calling for these to be applied across all infrastructure planning, projects and policy, stepping up investment in Scotland's infrastructure, including low carbon energy, transport, housing, while reducing and even eliminating investment in high carbon infrastructure will be key. So we welcome the Scottish Government's plans also to establish a Scottish National Investment Bank, particularly the reassurance that the bank would seize the economic opportunities of tackling climate change. Now we believe that the bank must adopt a mission-orientated outlook from the start. Now, this has been defined by the economist, Professor Mariana Mazzucato, who is also a Scottish Government advisor. She says this approach, this mission-orientated approach, is where government sets the broad direction for what a just transition economy would look like, introducing top-down legislative measures that are required, while local-level policymakers, stakeholders and businesses design bottom-up solutions to actually deliver the changes. And it was this kind of thinking, Mazzucato argues, that allowed the US to first put a man on the moon. That same big picture thinking is needed to make the just transition a success. So the Green Amendment today seeks to address the context in which the just transition will have to happen. Our global dependence on fossil fuels is driving the climate to breaking point, and all governments across the world now need to face up to tackling the emergency. And it will not be achieved if we only focus on the opportunities presented by low carbon technologies. We must also build independence from fossil fuels and act to ensure that at least some are left in the ground and out of the atmosphere. Now, both the Scottish and UK governments favour a policy of maximum economic recovery of oil and gas reserves, but at what cost? The science suggests we must leave the vast majority of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. A 2015 report in the journal Nature advised that one third of the world's oil reserves and half of natural gas reserves must be off limits if we'd have any hope of meeting the temperature targets set out in the Paris Agreement. And we're seeing climate leadership springing up now around the world. In April last year, the government of New Zealand announced that it would grant no new offshore oil exploration permits. Their Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern stated that this is part of her government's plan to transition towards a carbon neutral future, one that looks 30 years in advance. She said this would bypass the risk of acting too late and causing abrupt shocks to communities in our country. Good planning. Will we see this kind of climate leadership from the Scottish Government on this front too? In the same week that the First Minister attended the climate talks in Bonn, her MPs at Westminster voted for around 24 billion, that's right, 24 billion pounds worth of tax relief for the industry over the next 40 years. Tax break money that would be better redirected into renewables and decommissioning. The Greens report Jobs in the New Economy highlighted some of the opportunities that could come as a result. Our research suggests that over 100,000 new roles could be created in offshore wind, over 20,000 in decommissioning, and around 19,000 in building retrofitting. New jobs would also be created in education and training to support these roles and ensure workers have the skills needed for this new economy. These are high quality, skilled jobs. And unlike those that rely on non-renewable resources, they're secure. Ultimately, we need to take heed of the demands of the Paris Agreement and the recent warnings from the IPCC We've 12 years left to drastically cut emissions and avoid the most devastating consequences of global warming. Our actions over the next decade will determine the impact of climate change here in Scotland and overseas. Setting stretching targets now could drive the innovation needed to spark the just transition and mitigate the most damaging effects of climate change. We want to see increased ambition on our 2030 target to hasten that drive to net zero. The purpose of targets is to send the strongest message to drive innovation, especially where future pathways are unclear. The kind of mission-orientated policy approach advocated by Professor Mazzucato can help some 
of the most intract to help solve some of the most intractable challenges of our times. But it does need bold government leadership. The earlier this transition begins, the better chance we have of a fair and just approach to tackling this climate emergency, one that can deliver prosperity and well-being, the reindustrialization of communities cast aside decades ago, a rebirth, not an ending, and a viable future for our world. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I'll call on Tavish Scott. Mr. Scott, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Today's Just Transition debate does enshrine the importance of building a fairer and more equal society while transitioning away from carbon-dependent industries. But that must recognise the impact and alternatives on working people and communities across Scotland dependent on high carbon sectors, notably oil and gas. Now, the Scottish Liberal Democrats have consistently forced the pace in countering climate change threats. We established the first ever renewable electricity targets some years back and set up the Green Investment Bank. And we have continued to press for incentives to help people switch to ultra low carbon vehicles and make our homes warmer through the right fuel poverty policy. So in this transition debate, and indeed in the work of the Commission that the Cabinet Secretary set out uh, today, there needs to be a particular focus on those sectors where emission levels have barely budged since 1990, notably around buildings, agriculture, and indeed transport. Even though technology is getting cleaner, transport is still immeasurably challenging because of increasing demand uh, and indeed poor uptake so far of the alternatives. But it's why we do not support, for example, uh, any plans for a £250 million tax cut for aviation. So if I could encourage the finance sector in one area, uh, particularly at this time of financial challenge, it is, it is to note the publications today of uh, glowing press statements from Edinburgh Airport saying how well the airport's doing, uh, the growth and the uh, record number of passengers doesn't suggest to me an industry that is in great need of the largesse he has uh, when there are many other pressing areas of need, not least to which in environmental policy terms. Uh, on oil and gas uh, before Christmas, Enquest, the current operators of the Sulem oil terminal in Shetland, held a commemoration dinner for, to recognise 40 years of production. Uh, my whole life as an islander has seen the change of that industry uh, literally on our doorstep. Uh, oil and gas in uh, Shetland to this day still employs 150 to 300 personnel on site, and that's just the direct jobs. 66 oil tankers went through Sulemvo in the last year. Five million tonnes of oil uh, were exported, 105,000 barrels uh, per day. And 17% of the UK's undiscovered gas reserves are located west of Shetland. There are total gas fines. Chevron has sold the Rosebank field to Equinor, uh, previously known as Statoil, where there is a huge role for the OGA in oil and gas export routes. But the point in the context of this debate is about the Sulemvo Terminal Environmental Standards, the Shetland standard that was put in place uh, many years ago. That simply cannot uh, be compromised. Enquest have declared their intention to save £50 million per annum from the running costs of the terminal. Uh, Shetland depends on uh, our coastal waters to fulfil the potential of a 300 million seafood industry. So indeed does government. The food and drink sector, the food and drink uh, export uh, numbers would not look much without salmon uh, grown around Scotland's coastlines. So cutting pollution control and readiness at the terminal is therefore not acceptable. Shetland lived through the Esso Benicia and indeed the Brea. West of Shetland is a highly challenging theatre of operation. So I expect Shetland expects the oil and gas industry to maintain the highest standards of environmental protection and readiness in the event of any oil spill. And I'd ask the government to recognise that argument and to maintain a watching brief through the appropriate government agencies, including the OGA. The oil and gas industry is changing. On Maurice Golden's earlier uh, point, just before Christmas, uh, Shell announced that they were changing their executive pay policy uh, and linking that from 2020 to carbon uh, emissions, a link linking pay to hitting targets. A pretty novel approach uh, in uh, the commercial sector. One we might even try in politics one day, but uh, suspect that might be going uh, too too uh, too far. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, certainly, I think it is important to reckon. Uh, I th <laughs> don't tempt me. The, um, uh, I, I think it is important to recognise that there is some change uh, there. But as the Cabinet Secretary rightly said, we need a sense of realism in policy development over oil and gas. By 25, 2035, uh, the maximum forecast impact of alternative technologies will only reduce UK oil and gas demand to a, around 100 million tonnes of oil equivalent. This is more than the oil and gas UK industry will produce according to current forecasts. 
As, as Sir Dave Moxon of the Just Transition Partnership said to a parliamentary committee, there is a tendency to look at this issue in street quantum terms rather than to look at the quality of jobs and particularly middle income jobs. Uh, many, he went on to say many people who previously worked offshore now work as labourers. There is nothing wrong with labouring work, but it is not particularly good for an economy that people who were on £40 an hour now work on £10 an hour. I think that's a notable point that the government might wish to bear in mind. The oil and gas industry remains a hugely valuable asset to the UK, currently employing and supporting one out of every 100 jobs across the entire UK. As Angus McCrone of the Bloomsburg New Energy Finance said, again to committee, electric vehicles account for only part of oil demand. Cars account for only 20% of world oil demand. Even our, on our own very aggressive forecast for electric vehicle uptake, we will only see about 7 million barrels of oil per day being taken out by 2040 as a result of electric cars and buses. Overall demand for oil and gas in the UK in 17 was around 100 and 150 million tonnes of oil equivalent uh, per year, which was a 15% reduction compared to 2008. Again, a notable feature of how this is changing. So given that UK oil production was around 90 million tonnes in 17, even if alternative technologies are exploited to the maximum extent, UK production would not surpass this level of demand. So I don't think there is a contradiction between supporting an indigenous oil and gas industry already going through significant change, which supports hundreds of thousands of jobs, and supporting climate change action across Scotland and indeed across uh, Europe and the world. 80% of the UK's 27 million households are heated by natural gas, which has helped the UK reduce emissions and can be a transitional fuel for the future. Uh, two very brief points, if I may, presiding officer, on uh, agriculture, as that also was mentioned by uh, others. It's important to recognise that UK emissions have declined from agriculture by 14% between 1990 and 2016. But I think it's also important to recognise the dichotomy of existing policy and the challenge there between the high cost of entry into farming and even crofting for new entrants. Reductions in support payments will lead to two directions of travel for farming and crofting communities. Larger farms, agribusinesses indeed, will have the resources to invest in climate emissions, reducing technologies. Small units and crofters will just struggle with that. So the reduction of subsidy, which could negate some of the risk to investment, may further remove the incentive for these smaller, sometimes part-time businesses to participate and therefore create further inequalities across uh, agriculture. The Farming for a Better Climate initiative, backed by the National Farmers Union of Scotland, is a good one. But in that context, and especially in the context of the task force mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs last Thursday in this Parliament, uh, uh, I hope the government, again the finance secretary, will look at how that project is funded. If we genuinely want to see that shift there, perhaps the £375,000 spent in that particular budget line uh, might need to be reconsidered. And similarly on current agri-environmental payments, important across most of Scotland, they are based on income foregone and do not perhaps always provide sufficient incentive compared to the risk of participation. Some further thought by the task force in that area is important. I recognise too in winding up, presiding officer, the importance of no, I've been generous. I think I just asked you to conclude, And I uh, hope, therefore, that others, too, will back the Labour and Tory amendments, but I, too, would not back the Green one. Uh, thank you very much. As you will have guessed, there is some time in hand for interventions. I could be a bit elastic on the six minutes, but not so elastic it snaps. Uh, so, um, you know, six and a half minutes, perhaps but not too much. That's, you can see that for yourselves now. We've got Gillian Martin now to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Miss Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, I want a low carbon future. I want Scotland to play its full part in the fight against climate change. And I want to have spent my time as a representative in this parliament helping ensure that the decisions that we make to put in place the mechanisms, systems and decisions that will ensure that we're not stoning up catastrophe for our kids and their kids in the future. I agree with Mark Ruskell, there's, there's no greater issue for the world's governments today than climate change. And I've been listening to stakeholders' views on our efforts to reduce carbon emissions in Scottish society and sectors, but I'm acutely aware of the importance of ensuring that our decisions do not destroy communities and people's livelihoods. You see, my parents had their lives turned upside down as a result of the destruction of the sector that paid my father's wages in the 1960s and 70s. My parents are from Clyde Bank, and my dad was an engineer in John Brown's shipyard. Oil and gas gave my family a lifeline. 
My mum and dad packed us off to Aberdeenshire in about 1977-78 to ensure that we had a future and that my dad could have a second chance as a planning engineer, not of ships, but of drilling and production installations in the North Sea. Many of their friends did not make the move to the North East and many of my dad's friends never worked again. Um, multiply my family's stories thousands of times, maybe hundreds of thousands of times. Then add the next generation of native Northeasters who've been working in the industry since they left school and have known nothing else. Add in the wider economy that oil and gas prosperity has engendered. And you might start to get a picture of what impact a transition away from fossil fuels could mean to my part of Scotland and the people I represent if that transition is not one that takes into account the need for that shift to be one that is just, planned, managed and resourced. And as you can probably tell, presiding officer, this issue is deeply personal for me. The last two years have been tough for many people that I know who have wondered whether they keep their jobs or have lost their job. The North East should be at the forefront of all our minds as we move towards our shared ambition to transition away from the burning of fossil fuels. And I welcome what the Scottish Government has already done in that regard, particularly their investment in offshore wind, the city deals, transition training fund, and substantial infrastructure investment, particularly in rail that's ongoing. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's remarks about oil and gas representatives being included in the Just Transition Commission. But does our emission ambition mean it's the end for oil and gas? No, nowhere near it. We will continue to need feedstock for chemicals and manufacturing into the foreseeable future. There will not be one item in this entire chamber, either the furniture we're sat on, the clothes we're wearing, the building materials we're housed in, that has not got an element of oil-produced materials in it. Similarly, as we consider viable alternatives to diesel and petrol to fuel our vehicles to a low-carbon alternative, we can look at hydrogen to fuel our vehicles, as we're already doing in Aberdeen City. Hydrogen manufacture will depend, be dependent on the feedstock coming from our offshore reserves, particularly from gas. And last week I noticed that a German startup, Sunfire, was given 25 million euros investment from steel uh, industry in Germany to uh, power steel plants with hydrogen. So there's a good opportunity there for us to be supplying that kind of fuel going forward. But not only do we have the material resources that will power manufacturing and low-carbon alternatives, we have the expertise and supply chain capability in the oil and gas industry that will be vital as we explore the alternative renewable energy that will need to revolutionise transport, heat our homes, schools and hospitals. We must be harnessing that now, putting plans in place for the North East to be the energy capital, to be manufacturing the hardware that we can use here for that revolution, and explore our hardware and expertise all over the world in the same way that we've done for decades with oil and gas. We need to be investing in the research and new technologies as we're doing with high wind, with wind power, and scooping the kids up from schools into engineering that's focused on that renewables revolution and has the same guarantees of jobs at the end of it that oil and gas has for nearly two generations. On Friday, I was really proud to join uh, my colleague Paul Wheelhouse in the northeast village that I grew up in, Newborough to officially open the National Decommissioning Centre. I'm excited about what groundbreaking technologies they will produce. But decommissioning is not the consolation prize as we transition. It's just one of a whole suite of investments we have to make to safeguard the livelihoods of those in the North East. And those investments uh, can't just be a government's responsibility. And I guess that was the substance of my intervention to Maurice Golden. Um, which is why I asked about the responsibility that oil and gas industry and those private companies have with regard to this as, as, as we, we look for a, an alternative to burning fossil fuels. The Climate Change Bill means that Scotland will have the toughest climate cha change legislation in the world. By the end of this parliamentary process, it might get even tougher. Scotland is stepping up to the challenge. The huge potential for new jobs and opportunities arising from the transition towards a new, a low, carbon economy must have a northeast focus wherever possible. We are skilled, we are diverse, and no transition should ever have the same kind of negative legacy that happened to the shipbuilding communities in the 1970s. 
I know this government is focused on this, and I'll continue to argue for decarbonisation alongside arguing for the North East to be at the epicentre of an ambition to realise that ambition. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call Alexander Burnett to be followed by Stuart Steves and Mr Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And as I did last week, I'd like to start off on a positive note and commend Scotland for performing well on reducing its greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which has led to us as a country meeting our annual legislated target for 2016. And this means we are now 49% below the levels recorded in 1990. But however, as ever, there is always room for improvement. And this is only possible if our policies begin to reach into all sectors of our society and industry, particularly those that have not contributed as much as others thus far. Now, as a member of a Scottish Parliament who represents a rural constituency, uh, and I should note my register of interests around this point, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to raise the rural sector's issues and questions when discussions take place on transitioning to a carbon neutral economy. Because with one in 10 of Scotland's jobs being in the rural sector, it's a vital part of our society and requires support. And this could not be truer when discussing how to support our farmers in achieving a transition to a carbon neutral economy. Currently, the agricultural sector is the third biggest emission sector, contributing 17% of Scotland's emissions. And NFU Scotland has accepted that their performance has been poor in terms of reducing emissions. They have also called for governments to work with them by investing in resources and advice for food producers and land managers, and we support these calls. With over 70% of Scotland's land mass under agricultural management, farmers and crofters are responsible for the stewardship of many aspects of Scotland's renowned environment, and it's important that the Scottish Government invest in them. Unfortunately, however, our farmers still don't, do, do not know their future with what payments and support they will receive. And whilst the UK government has outlined their plans in the UK Agricultural Bill, the Scottish government has left farmers in the dark. Now, farmers face uncertainty in much of their industry. They are the ones experiencing the impact of climate change, and they know more than most how important it is to reduce our emissions. But this government needs to do more to relieve some uncertainty in their lives. So I ask the Scottish government to please consider the impact that they are having on our farming community by not announcing their plans for a new agricultural policy for Scotland. Yes, yeah, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Alexander Burnett for taking uh, the intervention? And it's really just to pose the question that does the member not accept that the Scottish Government's tried to give as much stability and certainty as possible? Certainly, uh, Fergus uh, Ewing, as Cabinet Secretary, has tried to outline the position. But the basis and the premise for the ongoing uncertainty is simply down to Brexit. And that is what is leading to the uncertainty for everyone and that sector, which we can move on from once we have certainty around Brexit. And I see some Conservative members shaking their heads. If they are in that level of denial, indeed, the Conservative Party has no hope whatsoever. Alexander Burnett. Uh, I think the best way of getting certainty would be obviously to be backing the deal tonight. Uh, uh, and, and, and I think it's only hypocrisy from the SNP benches to be advocating a position which is more, more likely to lead to no deal, while at the same time demanding more money uh, in, the event, in the event there is no deal. Um, now, if we do not support the industry now, uh, we will continue to face problems with achieving a carbon neutral economy. And any targets that are currently proposed are unlikely to happen if we do not engage with every single industry proactively. Now, NFU Scotland have outlined their vision for future agri agricultural support in their Steps for Change document. And this includes giving farmers and crofters the time and tools to adapt and become more resilient by putting the agricultural perspective at the heart of all measures from design to implementation. Now, it's not just the agricultural, forestry and fishing industries that will need our support to aid the transition to a carbon neutral economy in rural areas. The small, bit, small and large businesses, schools, organizations, and local residents will all need support in our rural communities as well. And the prospect of decentralized energy and digital connectivity offers an opportunity for rural communities to not only survive, but thrive. So we would like to see further engagement with our rural communities to aid this transition. 
and we need to listen and work with them. So it's vital that we do not leave them behind, as it will be rural areas that will feel the impact and have the biggest changes to make in order to achieve a carbon neutral economy. An important point to make was from Friends of the Earth, who put at the top of their briefing summary, that protecting workers' livelihoods, creating new jobs, and delivering a fairer Scotland should be at the centre of the move to a low carbon economy. And for our rural areas, which are doing their best to encourage people to live and work there, any policies which, which would seek to harm job creation would be detrimental to them. And all of these issues need to be worked on in a collaborative effort, and they can only be achieved by having our cabinet secretaries working in tandem. The carbon neutral economy is one that we must set out to achieve for future generations to come. So again, I ask the Scottish Government to ensure to reach out and engage with all areas across Scotland and not to leave our rural communities behind. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say to members, I understand why they turn round to listen to a member behind them, but not to spend the entire speech with their back to the chair. Uh, I, you may have found it enthralling, but I think it's a discourtesy, it's not a discussion. Mr Golden, I wasn't going to name you, but now I will. Uh, Mr Golden had his back to the chair for the entire duration of that speech. And I understand why, but I think it's a discourtesy to the presiding officer. So I don't think it should be continued. I just put that down as a marker. Uh, I could get cross. I'm being very gentle today, but that can lapse. Um, I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, and let me hope I say nothing to annoy you too much. Um, exactly 10 years ago, I was at COP14 at Poznan in uh, Poland, just as the, the uh, present uh, climate change minister has been at COP24 in Katowice in Poland. Uh, ten years ago, the uh, core of what we were discussing then was climate justice, and I had the privilege uh, of meeting Mary Robinson, uh, of the, now of the Mary Robinson uh, Foundation for Climate Justice, for the first time when she spoke at an event organised by the Scottish Government uh, ten years ago. Just transition has moved up the agenda as an important uh, item that we need to take account of in protecting people's jobs, exploiting uh, the skills and opportunities that come from the transition and supporting the people who will have to undertake it. Why does it matter, the whole agenda? Uh, well, in my intervention to the Cabinet Secretary earlier, I, I talked about uh, this, the United States and the move of employment from coal uh, to renewables, very welcome. If uh, we look at uh, the cost of Hurricane Florence, for example, the United States, it's estimated that single hurricane, which is broadly attributed to climate change in its ferocity, cost $22 billion in cost. So therefore, the cost of doing nothing on this whole agenda is enormous. And 10 years ago, we were being told by the UK Climate Change Committee that the costs of doing nothing were approximately 10 times as great as the costs of addressing the agenda. I haven't heard an update to that ratio, but there is little doubt that that remains the same, probably the ratio, as the issue has become more important, uh, has increased. So that is why we are addressing uh, this particular agenda. Now, the government uh, in Scotland has been doing quite a lot of things uh, to address this. Um, we've seen a just transition of drivers in ScotRail from the diesel trains, which uh, my back of the envelope calculation shows uh, between Edinburgh and Glasgow via Falkirk High burn 75,000 litres of fuel a week, um, whereas the now electric trains that we have there, uh, slightly more of them, with many more seats, carry 30,000 seats a day and only need the power from 10 wind turbines. Now, if you compare those two options, you can see why, in economic terms and in climate terms, we will be making uh, the transition uh, from an environment where we rely, particularly in transport, uh, upon oil. Now, oil is very important, and the industry in the northeast is very important for my constituents. I have the St Fergus uh, gas 
plant that brings a huge proportion of the UK's gas ashore, together with East Anglia, which is the other uh, main place, and some off, uh, off Blackpool. And the skills that have been developed in my constituents and in my constituency are transferable skills, ones that can enable us to build a new renewable industry, we've got to manage it. It won't happen uh, simply by accident. Uh, we've got uh, ACORN, Climate Change, a, a Carbon Capture and Storage Project, a, undergoing its early stages at St Fergus. Not quite the size of project that we had previously looked forward to at Peterhead Gas Station, an ideal place to have a carbon capture system because of its proximity to the pipelines that would take the carbonic acid away and into uh, reservoirs offshore. Will oil continue to matter to us? Yes, it will. We haven't found a way of successfully replacing oil in any meaningful way as a feedstock for our chemical industries. That's a challenge we can see some of the way forward, but we're certainly not ready to complete that transition. So we're not yet in a position where we can say oil doesn't matter to our economy, doesn't matter uh, to the future of the human race. But in transport, we certainly can see the way forward, and we should do. Oil is too precious for us actually now to be burning as much of it as we currently do uh, in transport. Now, let me uh, turn to the just transition uh, process itself. Uh, I very much uh, welcome this debate and its process on just transition principles. Um, the Labour amendment uh, I, I'm, I'm broadly comfortable with, I'm I think I'm not quite as comfortable as the Minister is because I'm not at all clear that independent of government and accountable uh, to Parliament actually makes sense and works. Now, why should I say that? Yes, there is a place for outside bodies that fit into that category. Examples would be the Commissioner for Standards and Public Life because they are our, our policemen, quis custodio, to, so it's custodians who will guard the guards. You need that independence for that role. Similarly, the Boundary Commission should be independent of politicians and should therefore uh, not report by the normal ministerial lines. But I genuinely have concerns that if you have on the policy area like this uh, an independent commission, first of all, the corporate body will have to, from parliamentary funds, find the money to fund such a commission every year. It will have to have a line of accountability to this parliament. How's that going to work? We know how ministers can be hauled at uh, our behest here to account for the areas that are their responsibility. This is not going to be their responsibility if it is independent and reports directly to parliament. Now, can I be persuaded on this subject? Well, I probably can. But so far, I think the argument hasn't advanced to the point where I've heard the arguments for that aspect of a just transition commission, which in principle I very strongly support. Uh, this is uh, an excellent debate. Um, some ministers have shown us the way to do things. In, 20, uh, uh, in 2008, the Welsh Environment Minister Jane Davidson uh, was able to travel by train from Cardiff to Poznan and Poland. Took her two days each way. As a minority government minister in 2008, I regret I had to fly. Hopefully, that doesn't happen again in future. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Mr. MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. Uh, last month, hundreds of energy workers and employers came together at a breakfast briefing in Aberdeen to consider how Scotland's existing energy industries could play their part in the future energy transition. Chris Stark, the Chief Executive of the Committee on Climate Change, set out the wider challenges. He stressed the importance of containing the increase in global temperatures to 1.5 rather than 2 degrees. He showed where Scottish and British emissions fitted into the wider global picture. And he laid down a challenge to the oil and gas industry, still by far the largest energy employer in Scotland, to get involved in planning and delivering a transition to a low-carbon future. The an answers were interesting, not least from those working in oil and gas. Will Webster, the energy policy manager at Oil and Gas UK, introduced Energy Transition Outlook 2018, the industry's first annual report on the implications and opportunities of future transition for existing energy companies. That publication and the briefing to launch it tell their own story 
Oil and gas workers, like coal miners before them, are citizens of the world, as well as skilled workers in energy production. They know the change is coming. They want to be partners in that change, not victims of it. And that is what today's debate is surely all about. They want, for example, offshore safety training certification from oil and gas to be fully recognized in offshore renewables. And they want to see the expertise uh, and experience from producing hydrocarbons over the last 40 years to be put to good use, as well as the infrastructure in sequestering carbon and storing it below the seabed in the North Sea. Workers in Aberdeen sadly know only too well the impact of unplanned change, and not just in the context of the recent oil downturn. Only yesterday, Stonywood paper mill was placed into administration, putting hundreds of jobs in the last paper mill in the northeast at risk. If government has a responsibility to support jobs threatened by global market trends, as I'm sure ministers will accept they do in the, co in the case of Stonywood paper mill, it is all the more true when it comes to jobs put at risk in the name of public policy. Many who worked in Scotland's coal and steel industries, and Gillian Martin mentioned shipbuilding in the same context, many of those remember only too well how their jobs were sacrificed in pursuit of government policy objectives a generation ago, and the impact of that is with us still. The whole point of a just transition is that such devastation should not be repeated in the name of public policy, no matter uh, how laudable the policy objectives might seem to be. And that is why Chris Stark's approach to our existing energy industries is the right one, to ask what they can do to support the energy transition, far more constructive and far more likely to succeed than advocating an end to production of oil and gas from the North Sea without reference to what the energy mix of the 2020s and 2030s might actually look like. It is nearly 20 years since UK demand for oil and gas overtook UK production. Reducing that demand below the level of production, as Tavi Scott said, is likely to take at least as long. Of course, we should support ambitious targets for renewable energy generation and renewable heat, for stimulating demand for alternative fuels across the economy, for improving energy efficiency and reducing emissions. But we need to start with what we want to achieve, what we want to make happen, not which jobs we want to abolish or which industries we want to close down. Outlining how we make progress without making redundancies is surely what a just transition commission is for. Last week, we debated ultra-low emission vehicles. And in that debate, I quoted uh, industry, motor industry experts who argued that 2018 might well turn out to be the peak year for petrol and diesel consumption worldwide. Now, that didn't happen because of a fall in demand for transport or a decision to decommission car plants. It happened because of action here and elsewhere to promote electric cars and vans and hydrogen buses and trains so that future transport needs can be met from lower carbon sources. And so we should take that same approach to other markets for oil and gas. Electricity generation has made big strides in the right direction. There is still more to do, but the decommissioning of Longanet came after 15 years of expanding wind power, not before. The next challenge is heat. 80% of British homes are heated by natural gas. Many homes in rural Scotland, which are off the gas grid, suffer from serious fuel poverty as a direct result. What we cannot do is force households to give up affordable gas heating for much more expensive electric alternatives. What we have to do instead is to promote lower carbon alternatives, whether that be biomass, whether that be from uh, uh, heat source pumps, uh, or indeed hydrogen gas, which may be one uh, uh, way forward in that sector too. A just transition is not just about justice for those working in the energy industries, it is about protecting consumers too. Energy policy must address climate change, it must address security of supply, but it must also ensure future energy is affordable for all, and that is no small task. We must also protect jobs in the wider economy. I've mentioned the paper industry, but that is only one of the ma manufacturing industries in Scotland which currently produce high levels of CO2 in their production processes. So increased energy efficiency in industry is essential, but it is not enough. We must also seek to drive down uh, emissions from the energy which will continue to be required. That is why carbon capture and storage will be critical. 
and Scottish ministers, I hope, will work with UK colleagues to make sure that the next attempt to develop CCS on this island is more success successful than those which have gone before. For all those reasons, we need an approach to a just transition which is serious and long-term and truly inclusive, as Claudia Beamish and indeed others have laid out, and I hope that Parliament can broadly agree on how to achieve that today. Thank you very much, Mr MacDonald. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Donald Cameron. Ms McAlpine, please. Thank you. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and we'll start by saying that if we're going to have a just transition to a carbon neutral economy, we all need to be more honest in how we debate the subjects of climate change and economic growth, both in Parliament and across the country. Uh, in this chamber and in the media, we talk repeatedly about economic growth. Indeed, it's one of the key measurements by which governments are held to account. Yet often the same vo voices who unequivocally demand accelerated growth one day can the following day argue with equal passion that we must reduce emissions at a pace which will kill off jobs. The Scottish Government's Climate Change Bill is the toughest legislation of its kind in the world. Tough but not destructive. The two ambitions for economic growth and significant carbon reduction are not, however, mutually exclusive, but they can't be discussed in separate silos, and that's why we need the Just Transition Commission. Uh, this is absolutely in the spirit of the Paris Climate Agreement, which emphasises the importance of social inclusion and ensuring that no family, no community gets left behind in this historic process. We can make the most of the economic opportunities offered by decarbonisation, a good illustration of how that is already working in practice can be read in the briefing today from Scottish Renewables. And in my own region, the global headquarters of Natural Power, a leading clean energy consultant employing 350 people, is situated in the small village of St Johnstown of Dorai in rural Galloway. And that's one of many, many good news stories that decarbonisation has brought across rural Scotland. But while I welcome the jobs brought by renewables in the region that I represent, I also note, as others have noted, that agriculture is a foundation stone of the economy, in particular livestock farming. That's not just about the farmers themselves, but the dairy workers, the local builders, the fencers, the seed suppliers, the vehicle franchises, the local shops, all of whom depend on a thriving farming sector. And we all know that cattle farming has challenges to meet in terms of carbon reduction, but the key cooperation, uh, the key aspect is cooperation with the sector. And that's why I'm pleased to see farming represented on the Just Transition Commission. And I also know that NFU Scotland's briefing for us today supports the government's approach to the climate change bill, because as it says, a net zero approach would result in the reduction of output and the decline in the agriculture and food sector, which I don't think anybody would want to see. I know that there are climate campaigners who do not agree with that approach. They would like us to embark on a journey at breakneck speed, which could devastate farming and food. That's unacceptable to my constituents in the south of Scotland. I'm pleased that it's unacceptable to the Scottish Government, and it should be unacceptable to everyone in Scotland who values jobs in our rural economy. If we are to prosper economically as a region in the South Scotland, we also need to improve the roads we drive on. Political parties across this parliament support upgrading those roads, for example, the duelling of the A75, uh, as an essential econo uh, to the economic prosperity of the South West. And I believe the government's listening to those arguments, but I'm well aware that there are those who will always oppose any road upgrades on the grounds that it risks increasing emissions. I'm not one of them, but I acknowledge that their position is consistent. What I find harder to accept is those who demand impossible emissions reductions one day while also demanding new roads with equal fervour. Uh, a just transition would find a pace of change which allowed road infrastructure improvements in rural Scotland where those were needed. This is not just about one sector versus another, however. Social justice is also about income levels and opportunities. In parts of Dumfries and Galloway, for example, it's often impossible for people to get to work, to see a doctor, to do the shopping without a car. And indeed, last week at the Scottish Rural Action event in Parliament, it was noticed that the traditional statistical measurements of poverty in rural areas are all often underestimated because they assume car ownership is a sign of prosperity when in fact it's a necessity. 
So any move to decarbonisation must acknowledge that rural car use is a need, not a choice. And while I welcome the government's initiative on electrical vehicles, it will be some time before they're affordable to most of my constituents whose wages are significantly lower than the Scottish average. I say that, of course, with the proviso that the Scottish Government is not responsible for the price of motor fuel or the duty levied on fuel by the UK Government. Similarly, people in rural areas like the south of Scotland have challenges heating their homes. Many are dependent on heating oil because there is no gas and the price of electricity is prohibitive. Indeed, the average domestic standard electricity bill in Scotland for 2017 increased uh, by £43 to £600 £6 last year, uh, while the price of gas fell, which certainly doesn't make any environmental sense. Again, I realise that the Scottish Government does not regulate the energy companies and so has no control over bills. Um, but it's important to put uh, just transition into the context of fuel poverty, which is higher in Dumfries and Galloway than most other parts of Scotland. Again, that is why I welcome the presence of experts on fuel poverty on the just transition Commission. Social justice is at the heart of this debate. We are reducing our carbon emissions to help communities and individuals thousands of miles away whose livelihoods and homes, whose lives often are threatened by rising sea levels and dreadful droughts. We have an obligation to them and that is why uh, our ambitious uh, reduction targets should be welcomed by all. But we also have an obligation to those living in poverty in this country or those who would be plunged into poverty if their jobs were lost as a result of policies which were not considering just transition. And that is why I support it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Mr Cameron, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by referring to my register of interest, specifically uh, residential housing, renewable energy and farming? Um, I welcome the opportunity to contribute to what has been a generally consensual uh, debate, and it's an important debate, particularly as we look forward to the Eclair Committee's Stage 1 report into the Climate Bill, a bill which will help shape and define our approach to making Scotland greener and more environmentally sustainable. There is, of course, a much wider importance to this debate because the actions that this Parliament, this Government takes, will help contribute to a global effort to reduce carbon output. We must all be mindful of the SR15 report published last year by the IPCC, which noted that if global carbon emissions continue on their current trend, we may reach global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels between the years 2030 and 2052. Indeed, whilst almost everyone will be impacted by such a global temperature rise, it will be more than likely that this will have the greatest impact on some of the poorest parts of the world. So there is clearly a lot at stake. With all that said, we must ensure that where we seek to reduce carbon emissions, whether that be in the housing sector or in transport, that we allow businesses and other organisations the time to adapt and that government provides proper support to allow these changes to occur. And as my colleague, Maurice Golden, noted earlier, transforming our economy in such a way to meet these changes comes with risk and we should seek where possible to work at a UK level and a Scottish level to help our country uh, meet these challenges. Uh, in my speech, I'd like to address two specific areas, uh, the agricultural economy uh, and housing. In relation to the agricultural economy, which others have spoken about, uh, I do feel that this is a sector which would uh, feel a significant burden should any changes be rushed through with little or no consultation uh, and without cooperation. And Joe jo McAlpine was absolutely right, in my view, to speak about the need for cooperation within that sector, because it truly does require a just transition. Our agricultural sector is vitally important to Scotland's economy, and we know from recent debates in this chamber that it supports thousands of jobs, manages much of our natural environment, and maintains the existence of rural communities across the country. Farmers, crofters, uh, land managers right across Scotland have already made a contribution to reducing carbon output and helping our natural environment from planting hedgerows and trees to investing in more fuel-efficient machinery, it's clear that this sector realises the need to adapt and, more importantly, is willing to adapt. But I was very struck by uh, comments that Tavish Scott made uh, in relation to the fact that smaller farmers and crofters will find it much harder to transition to a, to, uh, in terms of reducing emissions 
than larger farms or agribusinesses. And I think that's absolutely right. Um, and that should be recognised as we move forward in re redesigning agricultural support um, in Scotland. And the NFUS has recognised that reaching the existing 90% target will be very challenging itself for the farming industry. And they've acknowledged the need for there to be a strong focus on environmental benefit and delivery as a central plank of a new Scottish agricultural policy. Indeed, the agricultural sector, I believe, recognises that making such changes will not only benefit the environment, but could also be more cost-effective for farms and drive up production. And I think we all recognise that this is a sector in particular which needs time to adapt and to change. Turning to housing and fuel efficiency, uh, I'd like to touch on this area. Uh, again, another sector which has to adapt if we are to achieve a greater transition towards a low-carbon economy. Scotland's building remains, uh, remain one of the largest contributors to emissions in Scotland. And we have to look at ways of improving home efficiency, building more sustainable housing, incentivizing property owners to make changes that will save them money, and also address the challenge facing the world in relation to climate change. As the government's own figures state, 19.7% of total greenhouse gas emissions in Scotland originate from buildings. So there is a lot of work to do. I recently had a particularly interesting meeting in the Highlands regarding the German passive house model, which seeks to create homes which have a high level of occupant comfort while using very little energy for heating and cooling. In short, building better and warmer homes. One particular example of this project has been successfully executed out with my region, but um, I think it's called the Dormant Estate near Lockerbie, where eight, two and three bedroom semi-detached properties were built to passive house standard. Um, following a two-year study of the energy performance of these properties, it was shown that not only were bills substantially less than that of the UK average, but that total energy consumption per annum for a passive house building was just 10% of the total UK average. In short, passive house is a type of housing which consumes less energy, but also creates a saving for consumers who live in them, a prime example of how making our homes more energy efficient can help reduce carbon output. output. That is not only beneficial for our natural environment, but it's also beneficial for our society too. To adapt our homes in order to conceive heat and to save energy will inevitably help the most vulnerable people in our society. The CPG on Health Inequalities, which I co-convene, took evidence last year from the Energy Agency, which looked at the effects of the HEAPS program on 30 what were described as hard-to-treat properties. And they found that installing uh, insulation meant that 93% of residents felt that the overall condition of their home had been improved. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's clear that we must take action to contribute to the global effort to reduce carbon output and create the conditions for business and industry to transition justly to a low carbon economy. We must be effective in our approach, but mindful of the challenges that lie ahead. And above all, we must take an evidence-based approach and government must play its role in supporting our industries to take the steps required to achieve a positive outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Cameron, I call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Jamie Halper-Johnson. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you, President Officer. I think it's fair to say that the IPCC's uh, 1.5 degree centigrade special report uh, published last October was a wake-up call for all of us, and if it wasn't, it should have been. Uh, the report brought significant clarity to the scientific evidence on the impacts of global warming, including the valuable summary of the evidence of impacts at one and a half degrees. And thanks to another two reports published last year, the UN's uh, emissions gap report published shortly before COP24 in Poland and the Met Office's UK climate prediction, uh, they both, they, the, the three of them helped give clarity on the Scottish, UK and global position that the world has already reached around one degree centigrade of post-industrial warming. We're on course for an alarming three degrees centigrade. Extreme weather events happening now can be attributed to warming at this scale with confidence. And faced with these facts, NGOs continue to claim that current national pledges are not sufficient to keep temperature increases to the Paris goal of one and a half degrees. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for the calls for a zero emissions target being set in the bill but we have to be realistic about the target dates we set. That said, um, we all await with interest the views and advice of the UK Committee on Climate Change in the spring, which will hopefully set out a pathway for the nation to achieve carbon neutrality. As we know, Scotland's draft climate change strategy has a headline target of achieving 100% reduction in carbon emissions as soon as possible. 
However, at this moment in time, the UK CCC advised that a 90% target for all greenhouse gases by 2050 is still the limit of feasibility. But that said, I was pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary state in the Chamber last November that, and I quote, if the CCC advises that even more ambitious Scottish targets are now credible, we will adopt them, end quote. So it's clear that the Scottish Government wants to achieve net zero, but it must be done credibly and socially responsibly. And that's where the assistance of the, Justice, uh, the Just Transition Commission will come in, which will provide members with practical advice on promoting a fair, inclusive jobs market as we move to a carb carbon neutral economy. But before I turn to the Just Transition Commission, it is maybe worth reminding the Chamber presiding officer that Scotland achieved a 49% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions against the 1990 baseline, and that we recorded a 10.3% year-on-year reduction in carbon emissions between 2015 and 16. And of course, our country's carbon footprint will also be reduced thanks to the six large-scale uh, renewable energy projects which have been approved, not to mention the world's first floating wind farm and the country's largest solar farm, which has been given the green light. And many working on these projects have already transitioned from the oil and gas industry. Now, we've spoken in the past uh, about picking the low-hanging fruit when it comes to reducing the carbon footprint. However, one box which hasn't been ticked, and it is, I believe, a piece of low-hanging fruit that we've missed, is tackling the 14,000 Scottish homes that still use coal as their primary heat source as well as 186,000 domestic properties that rely on oil or bottled gas. It's estimated by Scottish Renewables that homes using coal emit on average more than four times as much carbon as those using electric heat pumps, biomass, boilers or solar thermal panels. Now clearly, with the closure of Langanet, uh, coal-powered el electricity generation has already, thankfully, become a thing of the past in Scotland, but I believe it's time household coal heating was consigned to the dustbin of history too. The short-term employment opportunities such a commitment would create are high and would help to ensure workers successfully transition as the employment landscape shifts. We all want cleaner air and healthier environment and less of the harmful emissions which cause climate change. Getting rid of coal as a household fuel would be a small but significant part of that. And that was an issue raised by Swedish academic Anders Wickman when he gave evidence to a clear committee before uh, recessed when he said that there's a need for a Europe-wide discussion about support for communities reliant on the coal industry. Now, before I close, President Officer, I'd like to return briefly to the Just Transition Commission, which will be invaluable in the coming years as we see a more resource-efficient and sustainable economic model introduced in what must be a fair and socially just way. We must be keenly aware of the potentially disproportionate impact a badly managed transition could have in, for example, rural areas and those working in the agricultural industry. Clearly, food and farming have a crucial contribution to make to mitigate and start adapting to climate change. But let's not forget that the entire agricultural industry is made up of thousands of SMEs. I think it's fair to say that farmers get that they have to play their part, but first-class support and planning for tradition, uh, transition in the agricultural industry is imperative. And personally, I'd like to see a return to the old-fashioned Department of Agriculture advisors who had a good rapport with the local farmers on their patch and gave them advice free of charge that they required. Now, I know the free of charge bit's a big ask. However, I think such a, a service will be crucial if we're to ensure the agricultural industry is 100% on board because the policy decisions that could be made to secure reductions in emissions from agriculture will potentially have a major impact on the industry. Ensuring that, funding of the farming, uh, we have to, ensuring that funding of the Farming for a Better Climate initiative is significantly in, increased from the very low £375,000 per annum, which Tavish Scott has already mentioned, will go some way to helping support change in this specific industry. Now, uh, I've run out of, nearly run out of time, but... Uh, I, if I you have something pressing to say, Mr MacDonald, I've got the time. Excellent. Um, the... <laughs> The NFUS has provided us with uh, an excellent briefing in advance of today's debate. There are clear concerns that if a net zero target were set, the sequestration that would be possible through various activities that can be undertaken on land, such as tree planting, peatland restoration, and investment in renewables, is not likely to be sufficient to reach net zero. So is the next step a reduction in output, which translates to a decline in agricultural and food sector? 
It will therefore be critical, in my view, President Officer, that any pathway to reduce emissions will allow for maintaining Scotland's farming industry and output. Uh, that said, as I mentioned earlier, better progress can be made if our government works with the industry to invest in resources and advice for food producers and land managers. Have I got any more time? <laughs> uh, not too much longer, okay. please. <laughs> In closing, President Officer, uh, I'd just like to touch on the issue of carbon capture and storage. If we are to set a, a target at net zero in the future, we must consider the impacts on jobs of all high-emitting CO2 industries in Scotland, not least the plants in my constituency in Grangemouth. The Scottish Government must do all it can to support the development of CO2 transport and storage infrastructure in Scotland to enable industries to greatly reduce their emissions. I know much has been done and I welcome the recent vote fast by the UK Government with regard to support for CCS, clearly recognising that CCS enables industry to keep producing and retaining jobs that would otherwise be lost if production was transferred overseas or shut down altogether, which of course is a risk we must always keep in mind. Something else for the Just Transition Commission to consider. Thank you, President Officer. Jamie Halker Johnson, followed by Alistair Allen. Uh, thank you, and can I refer members to my register of interest, particularly in relation to the farming business of Jay Halker Johnson & Sons. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, this debate is an opportunity to look ahead to a future that will hopefully be diff uh, quite different. One of the defining challenges of this generation has been not just to tackle climate change, but to find a way for our society to live more, har more harmoniously with our natural environment. The priorities that climate change drive forward remind us that our relationship with the wider environment is fragile. Scotland, and particularly my own region, the Highlands and Islands, has a long relationship with environmental management, and particularly the production of environmentally friendly energy. While Scots were drivers of the Industrial Revolution, we're also a country that has made significant inroads in developing and expanding hydroelectric power throughout the 20th century. We've harnessed wind energy on a significant scale, and we are home to the innovative developments in areas like wave and tidal generation, including in Orkney, for example, uh, EMEC, the European Marine Energy Centre, which is a global centre of marine energy research excellence. But organisations like EMEC uh, e e need our support, and one of the major contributions we can make is to work with industry more effectively to ensure a pipeline is in place to provide the sort of skills that this sector needs. And I'll touch on that later. For all our advantages, we also know all too well that decarbonisation has been driven intensely in certain sectors, but with little progress made in others. In its progress report in September, the Committee on Climate Change made clear that there were, and I quote, no significant emission reductions in most sectors outside, the electric outside electricity generation and waste over the five years to 2016. That is a statement that should cause us all considerable concern. And as the Economy Committee heard during their inquiry into climate, the climate change plan, we need clarity from the Scottish Government on the policies that will help meet our targets. There are two obvious areas where significant progress will have to be made to come close to meeting those targets. These are in transport and buildings. The CCC identifies transport as Scotland's biggest sectoral challenge. Scotland has lagged behind the rest of the UK on the uptake of electric vehicles. As the committee observes, we need far more concrete planning for significant progress to be made. And as, a, and as Donald Cameron mentioned, in housing there's been work on energy efficiency there is still far greater scope for future-proofing new-built homes. Working in these areas to develop sectors that are carbon conscious will depend both on direction from government and their own capacity and skills base. To take agriculture as an example, as Alexander Burnett also highlighted, the sector is aware of the need for change. While the direction of travel is clear, bodies like NFU Scotland have recognised the particular challenges that the sector um, has. As they observe, Scottish agriculture contains with it a complex network of thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises run along a range of very different models. Where considerable change will be required, even in the future, it seems obvious to me that government engagement should be given priority to best equip sectors to adapt. It is undoubtedly also true that a lower carbon future will touch a great many parts of the Scottish economy, some it seems more than others. These changes in our economy will have costs, but they also create opportunities. The greatest risk is that we absorb all of the costs while seeing few of the benefits. Scotland can be a world leader in decarbonisation, and we have made significant progress towards that end. 
Business in Scotland can benefit globally from, skills that we, from the skills we create and foster locally. The reality, however, is that many of the jobs promised in the past from low carbon technology have simply not materialised. We have seen opportunities lost as, these, as contracts here in Scotland have been fulfilled, but with the skills and facilities in other places. If we have the natural potential to be a global centre for decarbonisation, we must ask ourselves why these skilled jobs have not come to fruition in the past. The costs, however, are very real. Many will fall on Scotland's SMEs who have raised, for example, the impact of low emission zones on their businesses. The level of collaboration between the public sector and SMEs on decarbonisation is clearly below what it could be, and often it will be those firms that will bear a great deal of the burden of change. In a joint statement by the Just Transition Partnership, which contains not only environmental organisations, but also a number of trade unions and involvement from the STUC, they caution that, and again a quote, it is necessary to confront the danger of losing a large part of the industrial base of employment in traditional, as traditional sector declines. This is a very real issue and one worth highlighting. If we are to, if we are, um, to see fast change in our economy and wish to cushion some of, um, some of the negative effects of that change on people, it must surely be based around a firm offer of retraining and reskilling. At the risk of repeating myself in this chamber, I would point out that we lack a truly lifelong approach to learning. The draft budget in December promised the establishment of a national retraining partnership. This is at very least an indication that the Scottish Government recognises some of the challenges. The reality is that reforming adult learning significantly will take a considerable political commitment, but it will also make our Labour, party, uh, Labour market more resilient, not just in the face of the challenges of climate change, but more widely too. Presiding officer, while I appreciate that environmental considerations will motivate wider economic change, We've spoken today about a just transition. In doing so, we must recognize that many of the areas that we will have to, that we will have to contribute to, uh, the, the, sorry, in doing so, we must, we must recognize that many of the areas that we'll have to contribute to climate change targets, our rural economy and our small business particularly, are often already struggling. Costs will fall heavily on them, yet they remain an important thread that ties communities across Scotland together. If the Scottish Government and this Parliament is to be ambitious in, create, in reducing carbon emissions, it should recognise now the future challenges that change will present when new sectors have to play catch up in decarbonisation. Alistair Allen, followed by Keith Brown. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome this debate and the opportunity which it presents to reiterate this Parliament's support for achieving a car carbon neutral economy in Scotland. Now, as people never tire of hearing, I represent an island constituency which simultaneously contains some of the most environmentally sensitive land in the country and some of the greatest potential for renewable energy from both wind and the waves. And I can see and recognise the responsibility which we all have to get this transition to new energy sources right. The motion today therefore rightly focuses on a kind of environmental justice as have a number uh, of speakers today. The transition to uh, a carbon neutral economy in Scotland is one that we've already embarked upon as a country and clearly huge challenges remain in, in getting there but it's worth reflecting that Scottish carbon emissions have almost halved since 1990 and 49,000 jobs are now supported in our uh, low carbon sector. But it's also, mentioning, also worth mentioning, too, in all due national modesty, some of the things that Scotland does on this front which not all countries can lay claim to doing in reaching their targets. The Scottish Government has, for instance, further strengthened our commitment to achieving our carbon targets through domestic effort rather than via the alternative of paying other countries to make emission reductions on our behalf. And under our own legislation, Scotland will maintain a fair share of all international aviation and shipping emissions uh, within our targets. And again, no other country does that. We'll maintain emissions from land use and forestry counting towards our targets, something, again, which uh, is, is not something that's done everywhere. But perhaps what's worth saying about that is that uh, Laurent uh, Fabius, the architect of the Paris Agreement, has described Scotland's legislation as a concrete application of the Paris Agreement. So all that said, presiding officer, uh, renewables and low carbon energy will provide the foundation of our future energy system, offering Scotland a huge opportunity for economic and industrial growth. 
By 2030, Scotland aims to generate 50% of its overall energy consumption from renewable sources. And by 2050, uh, we aim to have decarbonised our energy system almost completely. The Scottish Government is supporting low carbon energy by establishing the Energy Investment Fund that will invest £20 million in low carbon energy infrastructure. Uh, and this will promote the development of onshore wind in Scotland and across the UK. And I believe it will also help support the marine energy sector. It will make it easier to invest in local and small scale renewables, which are so important uh, to communities like my own, and to develop a bioenergy action plan and will invest £60 million in the low carbon infrastructure. So the Scottish Government and Scotland's political uh, consensus more generally, I hope, clearly now want to uh, ensure that we benefit fully uh, from leading the global transition to low carbon. And so the decision, therefore, to appoint Professor Jim Skay to chair a commission on how the transition uh, to carbon neutrality can help Scotland uh, not just become greener but more prosperous is a very welcome one. It's a move that demonstrates, as if it needed to be demonstrated, the inseparability of environmental and economic progress for Scotland. Indeed, the Paris Climate Agreement itself recognises that just transition means moving to a low carbon economy in a way that leaves nobody behind. That means not just the public sector, but the private one too, working together to consider ethical and sustainable supply chains. So I hope that we may soon see some other direct economic benefits. Uh, again, thinking of my own constituency, but other places too, uh, 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 benefits that will uh, arise from Scotland's carbon agenda. I hope, for example, that we will soon uh, be able to hear further news on the future of the Arnish construction yard in Lewis uh, from its new owners who have committed such attention to ensuring that the new work comes its way. The yard is certainly extremely well placed uh, to carry out fabrication work for Scotland's offshore renewable industry, among other things. But the potential for this kind of work uh, to provide apprenticeships, uh, for instance, would be transformational uh, in retaining young people uh, in uh, economies, rural economies like my own, and the recently announced CNES 60 Foundation Apprenticeships in conjunction with Skills Development Scotland are already a good example uh, of a national local government partnership which seeks to achieve just this uh, in our island communities. And while there is still much potential in the North Sea oil industry, as a number of members have said today, there is also a potential for skills to be transferred from the oil sector into offshore renewables, providing both direct and supply chain jobs. Presiding officer, uh, although living in a windy place, as I do, brings with it uh, an obvious energy source, this very climate is, of course, one of the reasons for a major problem locally, and that is fuel poverty. In the Western Isles, uh, the recent figures show that fuel poverty stands at some 56%, compared to a national average of 31%. Other island communities face similarly stark figures, although much is now being done to address the problem by providing insulation, particularly for older house types. Renewables are also helping to drive socio-economic benefits and community development, uh, but are sometimes uh, hampered by infrastructure constraints, which uh, again make it even more uh, important in the longer term that we see an interconnector uh, uh, enabling um, island renewables to be uh, exported. I applaud the work that's being done by many organisations, uh, not least in, in my own constituency, the University of the Highlands and Islands, uh, and other institutions to make sure that uh, technologies such as domestic combined heat and power, hydrogen ferries, uh, and better insulation are at the top of our uh, agenda. But now we should make sure that uh, energy and climate change policy is island-proofed and ensure that the potential of our island areas to make a, a national contribution to a carbon neutral Scotland is fully recognised. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Keith Brown. President officer, I'm very pleased to have the chance to contribute to this important debate on securing a just transition to a carbon neutral economy. Some people have mentioned debates happening elsewhere today. And they may well be important, but what can be more important than the future of our planet and the livelihoods uh, of those in our society? I would want to want start by recognising the efforts of both the Parliament and the Scottish Government, uh, including uh, Stuart Stevenson, who took a very prominent role in the passing of the relevant legislation through this Parliament, 
uh, in pushing forward this agenda and making sure that Scotland is, as we've heard, a leading player in delivering progress uh, on this. And we have to talk about carbon um, uh, neutral uh, ambitions because that's so important to the future of the planet. But we also have to talk about just transition because that is so important to the people in our economy. And of course, there's much more work to be done in terms of climate change. There's, uh, this debate is a, a chance really to take stock of the progress that we've made so far uh, and the need to, of course, continually refocus on the job that still requires to be done. It's also important, though, to recognise that we have come a very substantial distance down the path to delivering a truly carbon-neutral economy. As has been pointed out by Maurice Golden, the amount of carbon emissions have virtually halved since 1990, dropping from 76 million tonnes uh, then to 39 million tonnes now, a reduction of 49%. These efforts, though, have to continue, and we have to also take advantage of our world-leading position uh, on this to maximise the potential for cutting-edge jobs and exportable technology and skills so that our companies and innovators see Scotland's economy feel the benefit in a very real sense. And I think the point that Gillian Martin made was very important. This is not just down to governments and public agencies. This must be down to the companies themselves. The private sector should be uh, driving much of this. And there are many Scottish companies which are at the leading edge of developing the technology we need to drive the reduction in carbon emissions further in order to achieve uh, the ambitious targets that we have set uh, as a nation. I think it's also true to say that um, government support is, despite that, very important. And I've been very troubled over the years to see the actions of the UK government, first of all, in relation to carbon capture, where they were in, then they were out, and they caused a huge amount of frustration within the industry and missed some vitally important opportunities, and least, not least the opportunity to be world leading, and also the incons inconsistent and ever-changing support framework for renewables which has been very damaging to the renewable sector. Uh, that many people, actually many people in the Conservative Party have said that themselves. The transition to new technology, such as the transformation in tackling carbon emissions as part of our strategy uh, to meet the challenge of climate change, inevitably means though that some ways of working and indeed some jobs will be threatened. And it's absolutely vital that we move, uh, as we move in that direction, we do so in a way that means the transition recognizes the essential need to see a transition also in the employment market so that there are skilled jobs to replace those that no longer support our low carbon emission ambitions. And I'm pleased to see that through uh, the actions described by the Cabinet Secretary, the Scottish Government has put jobs at the heart of its strategy. And as the Cabinet Secretary said in the Chamber in June, the low carbon transition involves and will continue to involve very real impacts on people, jobs and local economies. There will be many co-benefits, but there will also be genuine challenges, and that is why we need to take a balanced approach to meeting our climate, social and economic priorities. I think a very uh, far-sighted approach being taken by the Scottish Government, and I fully endorse that approach, which also recognises the direction that we need to move in to meet environmental objectives, but being sure that we ensure the impact on the jobs, the lives of people, uh, is fully taken into account and that the new technology does indeed create new job opportunities that can be a positive in the same way that transition to a low, low carbon economy is also positive. And it won't all be about technology. There can be other innovations we've heard in the debate. Uh, Tavish Scott's suggestion, I think it was, that MSPs should be paid according to their carbon output, which may well uh, change some of the pay differentials in this place between the front bench and the back benches and even the presiding officers. That would certainly be a just transition in my book. Uh, but I'd want to welcome the work of the Just Transition Partnership in seeking to achieve uh, the outcomes that I've just mentioned. And also the work that's been done by uh, Friends of the Earth Scotland and the ASTUC. I think I was at one of the first meetings of the Just Transition uh, Partnership and the very positive approach that's been, and pragmatic approach that's been taken by the trade unions. It was very refreshing as well as the approach taken by the environmental uh, um, um, members amongst that group. Uh, like me, they recognise the need for effective carbon reduction measures to be developed and implemented. We have willing partners on this just transition process, but they also reckon, recognise the imperative that uh, needs to put Scotland's skilled workforce in jobs which will be affected at the heart uh, of the strategy. The partnership highlights the need to put jobs uh, uh, right in the centre of strategic thinking across government departments and in terms of strategic planning for public infrastructure projects. Mark Ruskell mentioned the Scottish National Investment Bank, which I think he's absolutely right, could have a crucial role to play in this. 
And I know that its thinking is mirrored within the Scottish Government and that the aspiration of the partnership on behalf of their member organisations to have a key role in helping deliver on a low-carbon transition is and will continue to be welcomed in the Scottish Government. For example, it's a key principle of the Scottish Government that no one gets left behind as the employment landscape shifts, and all of us across this chamber, I would imagine, would be keen to support that. And the Scottish Government's Fair Transition Commission will take that work forward, bringing together stakeholders to develop a cohesive strategy to deliver on our shared objectives to bring down carbon emissions, whilst ensuring that the change required is achieved in a way which protects the jobs and communities. And as has been mentioned by one or two speakers, we shouldn't underestimate how difficult this is to do. Creating well-paid, meaningful work is not an easy thing to do, and it's not just one that can be done either by the private sector or the public sector, but it should be done jointly. And I also welcome another approach of the Scottish Government which will undoubtedly deliver results on this agenda and that is in terms of the importance of encouraging responsible business practices that consider ethical and sustainable supply chains. That's exactly the right approach to this. And in this, the Scottish Government must and it does lead and encourages the change in behaviour in companies, the public sector and the third sector, which in and of themselves are small but when added together can make a tangible and significant contribution to carbon reduction efforts. So if we do get this right, presiding officer, it can not only help to save the planet, as we have to do, but it can also make sure that as we do that, that everyone is treated fairly and has an equal opportunity to benefit from the economic potential of changing the way that we currently do our business. Thank you, presiding officer. Now move to the closing speeches. Mark Russell, around seven minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it's been a, an interesting, very wide-ranging debate here uh, this afternoon, and I think it's important that we reflect that ultimately this is about people. This is about people who are impacted by climate change around the world who are going to face devastating uh, changes to their communities, but also the people here who are undergoing transition. And I think, you know, Gillian Martin, I think, made quite a moving speech about the, the personal transition of her family from the shipbuilding work of the 1970s to the oil and gas sector. She talked about the oil and gas sector throwing a lifeline to her family. I think that's very powerful. And, you know, when I speak to communities in, in Fife, uh, who I represent, and the workers at, at Bifab, and, you know, many of these communities, many of these families are, are looking for a lifeline today. They're looking for a lifeline for economic opportunities that aren't just about oil and gas. They recognize that much of their income still comes from oil and gas, but they're also seeing a bright future there with offshore uh, wind infrastructure, marine energy as well, which can provide the jobs of the future. And they can see where the order books for the companies like Bifab are going to fill up in the future if we can get the right incentives uh, for that sector to grow. So, you know, part of this is about planning. And I think Morris Golden uh, talked about the, the importance of upfront planning. Um, and in many ways, you know, if we look at the, the closure of Long Gannett um, coal fired power station, for example, that, that, that closed early. I don't think anybody, you know, totally understood the, the date that it was going to close. And it, and it led to 350 jobs uh, going uh, pretty much uh, overnight. Okay, they were reallocated within um, Scottish Power and, and, and around Scotland, but, but the connection people had to Long Gannett, those exact jobs went. And much of the work of the Long Gannett Task Force was, was after that decision. It, it wasn't in advance of that decision. It wasn't about planning for the transition of those jobs in advance. It was very much about... Uh, mopping up the, the impact of, of, of that decision. Um, of course, you know, forward a couple of years on from that now, and you know, we, we see a, a transition happening in West Fife. We see uh, Spanish electric train manufacturer Talgo, a fantastic company I've met recently with the, uh, with, with the senior executives in the UK. Fantastic vision for local communities. And, and an investor who could bring a thousand jobs, you know, almost three times the level of jobs uh, that Longanit supported uh, back into West Fife. And, mm -hmm. Combined with other, um, you know, low-carbon industries in that part of the Forth Valley as well, you know, Alexander Dennis just over the water with the Kincardine Bridge as well, leading the world globally on the development of electric bus technology. So I, I really, I'm really excited about reindustrialization, um, particularly in communities um, that, that have been that have been blighted uh, over over the years. Um, if I could turn um, briefly to the Just Transition Commission, which I think has been a uh, an important part of this debate raised by many, you know, Stuart Steens, Claudia Beamish and others. Um, I think it's welcome that Jim Ski has been appointed, appointed as chair of the, uh, of the commission. I think that will give us much confidence that this is a commission that will be driven by the science and the imperative uh, for us to meet net zero emissions 
uh, and tackle climate change. Um, I think that Claudia Beamish is right. The Scottish Land Commission provides a model for how the current voluntary uh, Just Transition Commission could become statutory over time. I don't agree with the Cabinet Secretary for the environment that needs to stop its work overnight. I think we can move its work onto a more um, statutory basis. Um, and I think, you know, the Cabinet Secretary told us that there will be recommendations coming in 2021 and that there may be other ways to deliver uh, the long-term work of that commission. Well, I'd, I'd like to know what those ways are now because we do have a climate bill on the table uh, going through the Parliament at the moment. And if there is a way, if there is a sense here, uh, and I think members are, you know, just starting to get their heads around what the options might be here in terms of a, an independent body. But if there is sense here in, in having a statutory commission that is somewhat independent from government, then we need to figure that out soon because we are c coming to a point where the climate bill will be amended um, uh, potentially at stage two on this. Um, yeah, go on then. Yeah. Stuart Stevenson. I, I, I just hope the member might help us understand why it needs to be independent of government because that's my key area of concern, while I can be convinced, possibly. Mark Russell. Well, th that, that's to be considered further, but, you know, we have a UK, an independent UK CCC as well, and I think we'd need to look at exactly how an independent statutory body uh, could emerge, and, you know, hopefully we can have those discussions ahead of stage two. If there was a need for a framework to be presented in the bill, we, we can do that, and we can do it with, with a good evidence base as well. Um, I mean, other members talked about the, the membership of, of the, the JTC uh, needing to reflect all areas of concern. You know, um, Joe McAlpine um, and, and many others talked about this, and I, and I, think, I think that's important, you know, if we have, if to have a meaningful discussion uh, with those who have a vested interest, uh, but also those who don't have a vested interest in the future of, of sectors, then we need to have that meaningful discussion about what, are, what is the technological pathway, uh, what are the issues to do with transition of workers, what are the issues to do with training, uh, how do we affect that, what's the role of government in there. So it's important that those uh, sectors are sat around the table. I think the inclusion of fuel poverty experts is, is an important addition to the, the JTC. Um, there's been a lot of focus on agriculture. I mean, I guess this is kind of part two a bit of the debate that we had last Thursday. Tavish Scott, Donald Cameron, Joe McAlpine again um, raising the ch particular challenges that we have with agriculture. And yes, of course, that's going to be an important part of the transition. There are challenges, particularly with uh, small farms um, that don't have the... The, the, don't have the, the ability really to, to look at new t innovative ways of, uh, of changing practices because there just aren't the numbers of people who can, who, can, who can support that and crofters as well. And, you know, I like Angus MacDonald's idea of bringing back the agricultural advisors. Um, but, of course, we do have a, uh, an agriculture extension uh, investment from the Scottish Government, which, uh, you know, we have a program which is, can be targeted more towards mainstreaming climate change advice rather than um, just putting it into, you know, uh, discretionary funds that can be applied for through, through Pillar 2 funding. Um, I, I don't agree with the NFUS. I think there will be challenges, particularly with livestock, but I think if we can include carbon sequestration in the mix and get a more sensible way of measuring uh, the carbon emissions uh, and the total greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the agricultural inventory, I think we can come to a place where we can see net zero carbon farming. And of course, we wouldn't be alone in that in that France and many other countries around the world see that pathway as well. Um, I'll perhaps finish, uh, presiding officer, just by um, saying that perhaps one area where we've been a bit quiet this afternoon is on economics. I mean, I think you know, Mr. Mackay's had it, had it quite light up, up, up to now. Perhaps he's been considering the implications of Shell's executive carbon link pay policy on his own portfolio, should the Scottish Government adopt that. I'm, I'm sure he'd be quids in after this next budget. Let's see. Um, but, um, you know, Stuart Stevenson reminded us that the, the massive economic implications as laid out by the Stern report now, which is over a decade, a decade old. And I, what I would like to hear from Mr. Mackay in closing is about the hard economic levers, yeah, the hard levers that we need here, the Infrastructure Investment Commission, the Scottish National Investment Bank, the need to embed climate change at every single bit of, of Scottish government policy, and not just Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, but in terms of those economic investment levers, that's the bit that I'm really interested in because that's going to deliver a huge amount of change across the whole of Scotland's economy. Alex Rowley, around eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. The debate today has been positive in the recognition that we must take action when it comes to climate change. Equally, we must recognise 
that where people's livelihoods are dependent on jobs that extract or depend on the use of fossil fuels, then we must provide an alternative which protects their livelihoods and the communities that have historically relied on carbon-based economy for their jobs. So it has been said in today's debate, and as the Just Transition Partnership states, a just transition means moving to a modern, low-carbon economy in a way in which it protects workers' livelihoods, creates a new industrial base and delivers a fairer Scotland. Well, considering the impact of such a transition to our economy, it is both welcome and important that we must acknowledge uh, that this is not an easy thing to do. Our starting point must surely be to be honest about the progress we are making today. Moving to a carbon neutral economy is not a small or simple task, but the consequences of doing nothing are un unimaginable and we will never be forgiven by the generations to come who will pay the price of that failure. As Claudia Beamish reminded us, last year's publication of the special report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us that half a degree of warming would put hundreds of millions of people at risk of climate-related poverty. And there would not be a country in the world that would escape the consequences of that. We do need action in every country to combine climate change and sometimes that can seem such a tall order and people think, as individuals, I can't change the world. However, as Pope Francis has said, we need a conversation which includes everyone since the environmental challenges we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. He continues, obstructionless attitudes even on the part of believers can range from denial of the problem to indifference, non nonchalant resignation or blind confidence in technical solutions. We require a new and universal solidarity. So in terms of that inclusiveness, we must engage with the very industries we seek to change. And this is why Labour is calling for the establishment of a statutory long-term just transition commission that has the necessary funding, is independent of government and is representative of industry and the workforce where change is most needed. I also make the point again, we must be honest as to where we are at. The former energy minister, Brian Wilson, said recently, as the windiest country in Europe, we should be angry and embarrassed that every single turbine, turbine around us has been imported. I think he makes a fair point. We cannot just talk as we have done today about what a good idea a just transition is. We must take action to make it a reality. If we are honest with ourselves, then the actions today have been in insufficient for building a new economy for the future. For example, the announcement last month of a £160 million fabrication contract for the Murray East offshore wind farm awarded to a United Arab Emirates based firm raises many questions. That announcement led to the Scottish Secretary of the GMB, Gary Smith, stating and I quote, what we cannot entertain is more of the same across Scotland's renewables sector, where we have been fighting for the scraps from our own table. That certainly is not a just transition towards a low carbon economy. I have to say I struggle to see where the strategy is for the creation of skills, apprenticeships and jobs in the renewables sector. We need more focus from government at both Scottish and UK levels. Many jobs in this sector are high skilled and high waged, but we need the intervention and an industrial strategy to make that happen. 
Brian Molson reminds us that in the 1970s, the Offshore Supplies Office was established with the objective of securing 70% of the North Sea supply chain for UK companies. Hundreds of companies ended up providing thousands of jobs as a result. When it comes to renewables, we need an action plan. We need direct intervention from government, and we need that to happen sooner rather than later. The same... The same Derek Mackay. Uh, will, will the member, Alec Rowley, I actually agree with Alec on the um, benefits that we should enjoy from the onshore uh, supply chain. But does a member not uh, respect those matters of commercial confidentiality, but in relation to BIFAB specifically mentioned that the government has intervened uh, in terms of providing necessary support to try and ensure that there's work for the yards in Scotland. Is that not accepted by the members' very welcome intervention? Because last time I met the trade unions, they welcomed it. Alex Rowley. Well, I was careful, uh, presiding officer, not to mention BIFAB. Uh, what I specifically talked about is the contract that was awarded uh, to, to another company last year. Of course, when it comes to BIFAB, and I'm due to meet the Minister in, in the coming week to discuss specifically BIFAB, when it comes to BIFAB, I very much welcome the action that the Scottish Government has taken so far. But I think it highlights, it highlights that for the majority of renewables that are being constructed in Scotland, we are not playing a part in, in actually constructing, building those. The jobs are coming, are going to elsewhere. Other governments have intervened. Other governments have directly intervened. So we should learn the lessons of the past, as Brian Wilson says, where there was clear intervention so that, that people in this country could benefit from the jobs that came from oil and gas. We need to be doing the same. Can also turn because the truth is the truth is, is it's true in farming sector as well. The National Farmers Union of Scotland say they, they recognise the agriculture sector is criticised for its poor performance in, term of, in terms of reducing emissions. However, believes that big, better progress can be made if governments work with the industry to invest in resources and advice for food and land management. So again, we see a request to work with government for a plan and for the resources to deliver that plan. We need to have a forward-looking, proactive approach to the economy. This means an industrial strategy, a plan for the future that is clear and strong on actions. Is it not incredible that in 2019, over a quarter of households in Scotland suffer from fuel poverty? Rather than simply changing the definition of fuel poverty and introducing a target to reduce it to 5% by 2040, should we not be putting in place a plan and resources to make better progress now? Part of that would be a skills and training strategy to give people in local communities the jobs that would come with that action. We have a housing crisis in Scotland. Should we not have a national house bill strategy, we need to say that housing is a national strategic priority and build the houses we need. Again, if part of that national strategy is that we can ensure the skills and training opportunities are available in every community of Scotland so that jobs are local jobs. So to conclude, a just transition means investment in skills, in training and in jobs for local people. None of this is currently happening on the scale in which it needs to happen. Thank you. Dean Lockhart, up to 10 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me start by referring to my register of interests in relation to a smart meter business based in England. This has been an important debate. It deals with one of the most pressing and critical challenges facing this and future generations, how to address climate change by transitioning to a carbon neutral economy and society. As mentioned by a number of members, the backdrop to this debate are the challenges and the goals set out in the Paris Climate Agreement, which seeks to limit global temperature rises to well below 2 degrees and to pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Here in Scotland, we have seen significant progress over the past 30 years. 
Emissions have reduced by 49% since 1990, and much progress has been made towards the goal of a carbon neutral economy. However, progress has varied considerably across sectors in Scotland. Emission cuts of 69% from energy and 73% from waste contrast with low reductions of only 28% from agriculture, 21% from residential and just 3% from transport. In her opening remarks, the Cabinet Secretary uh, set out the steps the Scottish Government is taking to deliver future reductions in emissions through the Climate Change Plan, the Just, Transmission, uh, the Just Transition Commission and other initiatives. These targets include a wholly decarbonised electricity system by 2030, a reduction in emissions from the service sector of 96% and from residential of 76%. Now, these are, these are ambitious targets which we can all support, but significant challenges need to be addressed to deliver these reductions and to do it in a way that is just and fair to all members of society. Some of these challenges were raised during the debate. Uh, Jamie Halker Johnson and other members highlighted the fact that the climate change plan needs to set out more detail on how emission reductions will be delivered by the Scottish Government. This concern was raised during the Economy Committee's recent inquiry into the climate change plan. Existing Homes Alliance told the committee it's right to have ambitions, but it cannot be wishful thinking. It must be backed up by credi credible policies and resources to give us the confidence that these targets will be met. WWF agreed. We are disappointed by the level of policy detail and they called for a clear indication of all policies and proposals that will deliver these plans. Now, the evidence, this evidence led the Economy Committee to recommend that additional details on budgets, targets, timelines and policies be included in the climate change plan in order to deliver a just transition in a transparent manner. And I do look forward in the weeks and months to come as we debate the climate uh, change bill, uh, the government setting out the details of how these targets will be delivered. In addition to this uh, further clarity and detail in policy, we also need to see a whole of government approach to the delivery of a carbon neutral economy. Uh, the briefing from Scottish Carbon Capture and Storage circulated yesterday called for a just transition to be part of an industrial strategy that identifies the industries that will emerge in a low carbon economy and industries that will become less viable as a result. And also a strategy which takes a coordinated approach to ensure the jobs and skills from the declining industries can be transferred to the new emerging sectors. Morris Golden, in his opening remarks, set out a number of constructive proposals on how this could be delivered. He referred to an ambitious circular economic programme which would add over 40,000 jobs if the Scottish Government embeds circular economic practice across all portfolio areas. This would include the creation of new institutions such as a design academy, an institute of reuse, uh, microplastic uh, recycling facilities and waste hubs to promote best practice across Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government talking about coordinated approach and a strategic approach to this, uh, the Scottish Government can also facilitate the delivery of a just transition by working closely with the UK Government under the UK Industrial Strategy. This includes clean growth as one of the four grand challenges. The transition to a carbon neutral economy will require investments of significant scale. And the UK Industrial Strategy will invest over £2.5 billion in the next five years to support low carbon innovation, including the transformation of construction techniques to improve efficiency, making energy intensive industries competitive and making the UK the global leader for green finance to support clean growth. The low carbon economy in the UK is expected to grow 11% in the next 10 years, faster than any other sector of the economy. And Scotland can benefit significantly from the scale of this growth, the economic growth, as well as the investments under the UK industrial strategy, but only if it works closer, only if the Scottish Government works closer and collaborates further with the UK Government to capitalise on these opportunities. Uh, a number of M M MSPs during uh, the debate, uh, including Claudia Beamish, Mark Ruskell, uh, Donald Cameron, pointed to the need for increasing investment in training, education and skills to ensure that Scotland's workforce is ready for the challenges and the opportunities arising from the low carbon industries that are yet to emerge. If we are to equip Scotland's workforce for a low carbon future, we need to address the chronic underinvestment in training and lifelong retraining 
as Jamie Halcrow Johnson mentioned. Otherwise, the workforce of the future will not be prepared to capitalise on these opportunities. Um, there is a danger that we will lose out in significant opportunities if we don't have our workforce ready. And as Alex Rowley has said, uh, pointed out in the past, where we haven't had a strategic approach to these new emerging industries, uh, we have lost out in manufacturing jobs with the vast majority of turbines we see in Scotland being manufactured elsewhere. Uh, in delivering a just transition, another priority for the Scottish Government will be to uh, minimise economic disruption in the pathway towards a carbon neutral economy. For example, the, the Federation of Small Business has warned that very few Scottish firms are prepared for the, uh, the new low emission schemes planned for four cities in Scotland and expressed concerns about, uh, about a lack of consultation and consistency in implementing these schemes. Uh, we agree with the F FSB uh, when they call for more consultation and Scottish-wide st standards to be established when we are uh, introducing or when the Scottish Government is introducing new regulations in the pathway to a low carbon economy. Uh, we also need to see a coherent approach uh, across Scottish Government agencies as well, not just the uh, Transition Commission, but we also need to see Scottish Enterprise, the Scottish National Investment Bank and the Strategic Board all being al uh, aligned around the priorities and the implementation of policy in uh, this area. And perhaps uh, Derek Mackay in, in uh, uh, wrapping up can explain how the government agencies, the enterprise agencies will work together and be aligned across uh, this policy area. Uh, finally, Donald Cameron mentioned in his con contribution that this is an area where the Scottish government must follow an evidence-based approach to ensure that policies uh, work in practice. Uh, questions still remain over the Scottish Government's uh, policy proposal to tackle energy costs through the publicly owned energy company and how and whether this will work in practice. Two years after this policy was announced, the, the, the very viability of the publicly owned energy company is still open to question, as we heard from uh, uh, the Minister at the Economy Committee just this morning. I must say, I was surprised that we are still at the stage of stress testing the viability of this flagship policy announced by the First Minister two years ago. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, Scotland moves towards a low carbon future. It is inevitable that our economy will change significantly. Some industries will experience rising costs, others falling demand, new sectors will emerge that do not currently exist at the moment. There will be a need to balance uh, the uh, needs of small business, uh, unions, employees, large business, the fossil fuel sector, the renewable sector and new emerging sectors. To deal with all of these challenges, we need to see a whole of government approach adopted by the Scottish Government. But above all, we need to take steps, the Scottish Government needs to take steps to train and upskill our current and future workforce to be ready for the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. And I support the amendment in Maurice Golden's name. I now call Derek Mackay to close the debate. Around 12 minutes would take us up to decision time. Please, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I, uh, I'm delighted to say I think this has been a very uh, consensual uh, debate that we've had uh, this afternoon, an important uh, debate uh, nonetheless. And we've heard uh, throughout this debate uh, the principles inherent in the term just transition. Uh, they, they resonate right across the chamber. And I've heard a number of comments about a whole government approach, and I think that's right. But in a sense, I think we are moving towards a whole parliament approach as well. In, if nothing else, the agreement that this is important and there is a lot of um, opportunity to work together to ensure that, that we get it right and we share the, the ambitions for the just transition. And I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham, is particularly relieved with that level of engagement and consensus. Uh, the principles it do align with our national performance framework, our desire to meet the sustainable uh, development goals that, that underpin uh, that uh, and the principles and the, the outcomes in that as well. And yet we have set the aim to create a more successful country, but one that creates a sustainable and inclusive growth agenda, reducing inequalities and giving equal importance to economic, environmental and social progress. They go hand in hand. They aren't exclusive to each other. 
So I've heard many important contributions today about the targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, the climate change bill process uh, is in place to debate those issues uh, more uh, fully. I won't focus on that uh, specifically uh, this afternoon. What I did want to focus on, many members have asked about it, is my view as Cabinet Secretary for the economy. Uh, no one will be surprised to hear me say that I'm particularly focused on boosting Scotland's economic performance. And that's not because economic growth is an end in itself, but because it provides the jobs and investments needed to raise living standards, reduce inequality, and support high quality public services. And I appreciate jobs are so important here. The most impactful, purposeful thing we can do as a government is create those quality jobs. That is, that is so good for social inclusion and a better um, quality of living as well. But as the Environment Secretary has mentioned, Scotland has successfully combined reducing our greenhouse gas emissions with growing a successful and inclusive or more inclusive economy. Record low levels of unemployment whilst exports, R&D investment and foreign direct investment all continue to grow. However, we know globally that unmitigated climate change would cause extreme economic damage. And of course, that's what's focused in the mind as well as the environmental damage. And we also know that by being at the vanguard of a global move to carbon neutrality, Scotland can reap the economic benefits from the new markets and the investment opportunities that it creates in itself. So I want to be clear that industry will continue to flourish in Scotland as we decarbonise and that we're investing in skills for the future. And I'm sure that all members will appreciate that there's also an onus on the private sector, not just government to adapt in these circumstances and to take forward this agenda as well. As we invest in the skills for the future, I do want Scotland to be a leader in the technological and social innovations so that we can harness that innovation to boost productivity and create those new employment opportunities. Now, analysis by the International Finance Corporation indicates that the Paris Agreement will help open up $23 trillion, $23 trillion worth of opportunities for climate smart investments in emerging markets between 2016 and 2030. There's huge economic potential and one that Scotland, I think, is very well placed to compete uh, within. We're already delivering policies that demonstrate our commitment to a just transition to carbon neutrality. And I want to, as Economy Secretary, just highlight three live examples because I think they give that perspective of action that we're working on now. Firstly, around investment. Um, I think it's really important that we're committed to support investment in the low carbon economy. The budget proposes to do that and to continue that. We've already allocated 40 million pounds to 16 low carbon capital projects through the low carbon infrastructure transition programme. And now we're providing support for renewable and low carbon infrastructure through our £20 million Energy Investment Fund and £60 million Low Carbon Innovation Fund. This funding is helping to secure the low carbon innovators who will shape the future and ensures that we're supporting local businesses whilst attracting outside investment. But building on this investment, a number of men members have mentioned this. In the coming months, I'll introduce a bill to underpin the establishment and capitalisation of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Let me be clear, the bank will provide patient mission-based finance which will help create and shape future markets and help Scotland achieve its full economic potential. And the transition to a carbon neutral economy will be a central mission for the bank. The bank will have a role to play in Scotland's transition to a carbon neutral economy. I've committed to providing £2 billion over 10 years to initially capitalise the bank and this will make a material difference to the supply of capital to the Scottish economy by levering in additional private investment, supporting ambitious firms to flourish, enabling the kind of transformational change that is needed to achieve that carbon neutrality. We all know that the successful... Yes, I will. Mark Ruskell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way and for laying out this mission-orientated approach from the new investment bank. Would it not help that mission-orientated approach if the mission was clear, which would be a net zero carbon target for Scotland? Would that not help investment and innovation? Well, Derek Mackay. Well, I think I'm trying to be very clear that we're focus, focusing on achieving carbon neutrality 
and you know, that will underpin the work of the bank. So I think I am being clear in that regard. This is about technological and societal change that will make the innovation uh, necessary. So I'm, I'm very supportive of making sure that the bank helps uh, achieve that. But the other example I wanted to give, because it is important, it was that around Michelin in Dundee. It's an example where we were faced with a challenge in terms of that manufacturing, that industrial manufacturing, but to seize the opportunities and create jobs for the future, the intervention that we've made is absolutely focused on things like low carbon transport, circular economy, um, uh, retraining, upskilling, all of that. And of course, that'll be supported by government resource and the partnership that we have with Michelin specifically. And it did involve a cross-sector uh, approach with politicians, trade unions, the business, and key stakeholders such as the local authority. And Michelin Scotland want to create, of course, an innovation park that will stimulate development in remanufacturing, recycling, and low carbon transport. So there is a real life example of how we're acting now to try and achieve uh, those uh, outcomes. This will support our low carbon ambitions and economic development as well. And we'll continue to do all we can to support workforce to ensure that they benefit from the opportunities that a number of members uh, have uh, raised in a very positive way. Uh, the third example I wanted to give was around the Transition Training Fund because it demonstrates our commitment to ensuring that we provide the support the workers need to retain and uh, up, uh, retrain and upskill when industry conditions change. We've established a £12 million Transition Excuse Training me, Fund Cabinet in 2016. Secretary, could we have a bit of quiet, please? It's getting difficult to hear the Cabinet Secretary. Please it, carry so on. With, with that fund, it's specifically to support workers in the oil and gas sector in the face of rapidly changing market conditions. And we've supported over 3,600 people through the fund, of whom 50% have transitioned to work in new sectors, and 92% consider their job prospects uh, improved. <coughs> So we'll continue to work with the oil and gas sector to address the transformation expected and recent studies have shown that the job opportunities are there for the future as well but the jobs will be very different to the ones that exist today. New roles will be needed in areas such as data science, data analytics, robotics, material science, remote operations, nanotechnology and cyber security. Now furthermore to remain sustainable in a carbon neutral world the sector is also positioning itself to support the development of carbon capture, as members have discussed, storage and hydrogen projects. So transformation of this scale shows why a just transition approach is so important. Now, oil and gas has featured quite heavily in this debate, but I think we've shown how the North Sea is highly regulated with some of the most advanced and comparatively least polluting production methods in the world. And that means maintaining domestic oil and gas production can lead to lower net global emissions and increasing our reliance on uh, imports. A number, of mentioned, uh, a number of members have mentioned the importance uh, of the sector. So I've given a number of examples of my perspective as Economy Secretary and some of the interventions that we have been making. A lot more work to do. That's why the just transition uh, will be so helpful in giving us uh, the advice to take this forward in the fashion that the Cabinet Secretary uh, has outlined to achieve that economic, environmental uh, and social uh, progress. Now, in defence of the Labour Party, something I don't often uh, say, uh, the Labour Party is asking us to consider that statutory footing, and I think it's worthy of that consideration, and that's why we're quite comfortable uh, with uh, the amendment. I think a number of members have made very powerful uh, contributions today in terms of the change that's required, the geographic impact. Uh, Gillian Martin was very eloquent on that. Stuart Stevenson on, on the analysis, the strategy. John McAlpin on, on ambition and honesty. Angus MacDonald on the need for action. Alistair Allen on the role of the Commission, demonstrating its usefulness. And Keith Brown on the opportunities uh, before us. Uh, Morris Golden, I thought, this was his raison d'etre and clearly enjoyed the contribution in the, the debate. He almost didn't sound like a Tory at all, but one of these, these impassioned, equal water Tories that Morris Golden has uh, energised himself uh, on a mission with uh, Claudia Beamish's uh, contribution was considered. Mark Rusko spoke, I, th I think, very powerfully on the legacy for communities as well and the need for decent jobs. And Tavish Scott brought the realism to the debate uh, that was very welcome uh, and the, 
the support of, of rational, pragmatic change. No, there's no insult, Tavish Scott. It's all, <laughs> it's all compliments today. Uh, Donald Cameron spoke of a pragmatic uh, and considered approach, and Dean Lockhart as well on the importance of the economy. So, presiding officer, this has been a constructive, helpful debate that I think will help steer the just transition uh, through. And as we tackle the challenges and opportunities before us, if we do it in the fashion that we've done uh, this afternoon, then I think our country will be better for it. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on securing a just transition to a carbon neutral economy. The next item is consideration of business motion 15413 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a revision to Thursday's business. Uh, can I ask Graham Day to move the motion? Presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one wishes to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 15413 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion number 15414 on a committee meeting at the same time as the Chamber. And again, could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And that one will be taken at decision time. So... Our first question this evening is that Amendment 15380.2 in the name of Maurice Golden, which seeks to amend Motion 15380 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on securing a just transition to a carbon neutral economy, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 15380.3 in the name of Claudia Beamish, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to the division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 15380.3 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes, 85, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 15380.1 in the name of Mark Ruskell, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 15380.1 in the name of Mark Ruskell is yes, 6, no, 107. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Motion 15380 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham as amended on securing a just transition to a carbon neutral economy be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15380 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham as amended is yes, 86, no, zero votes. 
There were 28 abstentions. The motion, as amended, is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion number 15414 in the name of Graham Day on a committee meeting at the same time as the Chamber be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed and that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to a member's business debate in the name of George Adam on Paisley voted Britain's top town. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats. <laughs>